You are now entering Maximum Driftcast, the only drifting podcast hosted by a Spanish soccer mom, a 30-year-old silver-haired fox going on <laughs> 60, and finally, a 200-pound bowl of spaghetti with chimichanga arms. The champions, the champions. And welcome back to Maximum Driftcast, the only drifting podcast that can't go live because the internet sucks in, in the neighborhood where the studio is at that is not my house. Sam? Yep, that's right. So it's not a studio in your house that has a bad internet connection for the uh, umpteenth time this year. But uh, sorry you can't experience live, but hopefully you'll experience just after the fact if you are our, uh, our video audience. But yeah. thanks for joining in after the fact. And Paco, you looks a little bit quiet and uh, on your end of the side of the house. Not excuse me, your end of the studio, not your house. Well, actually, it looks like you have somebody sitting next to you. I thought it was Corey for one second. So let, let's switch the camera back to, to to you guys. Oh, there, no, oh, there you go. There it is. It doesn't look like Corey, but it's better looking though. Who's who's that gentleman sitting next to you, Sam? I don't know. I can't see because we're not live on <laughs> Facebook. Paco. No, <laughs> but there it is. Hello, yeah, Farouk. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, hey, that's you. What's up, man? <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? I'm uh, sorry, I don't know what who you're looking at or what's going on. Yeah, no yeah. one has uh, no one has eyes on the control <laughs> board, but you, Paco, Jesus, yeah. like, you're no, jokes. I, you, I, I know. I was, I was Paco, know, messing with us. Good. I'm gonna be a Paco joke explainer real quick oh. here. So Paco was making a joke that Farouk was sitting next to me because <laughs> he's he's on a video chat that's not next to me, but I guess maybe geographically on screen he was next to me, so that's the joke. It's good times. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Nailed it. All right. Every good, every, as we've said on this, jo- or this show multiple times before, um, every good joke deserves to be explained. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You understand. <laughs> so, and, then, and then we also have a ghost voice in the background that is not a uh, physical video person. He's only on audio only. Isn't that right? Ghost man? That is correct. Hey, Hello. there's another person here. And and who might this other individual be? This is Aaron Losey. Hello. Hey, and what? Uh, so, Brooke, we know you from from your Formula Drift career. And Aaron, what uh, what do you do? I host drifting events. Like what? Lone Star Drift. Boom. That's it. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Good show, and uh, we will see you next week. Bye bye. All right. Goodbye. <laughs> Roll the credits. Yeah, and Corey is uh, not with us today. He is out with a cough or a cold or whatever uh, Corey Hosford gets. Or maybe he had a raid in WoW. I guess we'll, we'll find out. I think he had explosive diarrhea I from, mean, from all the turkey this weekend. I mean, yeah, it's just the day-to-day in the life of uh, Hosford. So he's, uh, he's getting through it, whatever it might be. But yeah, hopefully we'll have him back next week. But uh, so we got Fruk. We've got Aaron. What's up, dudes? How, uh, how's life? Life, uh, is life is amazing. Is, life is good, <laughs> right? Stop talking right, over I, each other, guys. <laughs> no, everyone, both of you guys are going to talk at the same time. Perfect. Um, but uh, let's start with uh, Fruk, maybe. Fruk, what's, uh, what's new with you, man? Uh, not much, man. Just uh, getting ready for a big event um, that we host in December up at Sonoma. And kind of putting all our ducks in the row for that. Um, finished up a ridiculously eventful season. Let's put it that way. And uh, just getting ready for next year. And uh, Aaron, what are you up to, man? Uh, I finished my Lone Star Drift season. I went to Vegas for SEMA. So I haven't been home since SEMA. I then went to Japan, took about 20 Texans or 25 Texans with me. And uh, we drifted at SEMA or in Japan at Ebisu for three weeks. And I just got home. That my is, first day home. That is insane to... Uh, to uh, be out there in Ebisu with a bunch of, I can only imagine with 20 Texans at Ebisu. Uh, I'm sure you guys had very thick accents up in there, right? Uh, since we're at Ebisu during Matsuri time, it's mostly English speaking people. Oh, really? Uh, so the, the accents that are actually hard to understand are like everyone else. The, the Americans are pretty easy. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, so, incredible. it's a lot of fun. It's the Scottish people and all those type of people, the Irish and everybody else that are difficult. Yeah, I mean, before we get into, uh, I think the bread and the butter, the bread and the butter, as the saying goes, of the show. Uh, what? Uh, so, why did you go to uh, Ebisu? 
Uh, because I love drifting. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's the easy answer. It's like the purest, coolest place for drifting in the world. It's the only place you can basically go and drift like every day of the week. Right. Um, I host a series, like a pro am series for FD, but I also host one for myself. Well, they both are just normal series and everything. But one's called Texas Street Legal, and the winner of that series, I take them to Japan. I took the winner for three weeks. I pay for everything. I give them a car, so I gave them a right hand drive Sylvia. Um, get them into the track, pay for tires and gas and entry and plane ticket and food and accommodations and rental car and everything, and take them over there and drift for as long as he can take it or the car can take it and everything else, and then um, bring them back. Whoever gives yeah. up first. Yep. The car lasted multiple trips, but we did blow up the car this time. Uh, <laughs> it lasted seven days this trip, and then it blew up. <laughs> That's incredible, though. Mine's lasted about 70 days maybe there, though. Still same transmission and engine and stuff. It's rad. Yeah. Well, that sounds like an incredible experience that uh, I've never even been out to Japan at all. I'd love to actually see Ebisu someday, but it sounds like you and uh, 20 Texans really got down at the Matsuri. Hey. Yep. <laughs> yeah, everybody, every, everybody was there, right? Like Chelsea. Uh, who else made it over there? Yeah, Chelsea's a good buddy of mine. So we took Chelsea. Um, we had Nakamura come out and drive with us. Uh, Daigo came out. Um, who else? Shinji Manoa. He is an amazing driver. Robbie Nishida came out. And then just a bunch of my Pro-Am guys, guys from all over the nation and all over the world. That's incredible. That's, that's badass. So we, I think largely we have you guys on the show to, to have a discussion that we've wanted to have for a while. And we always, I would say that we discuss it almost every show, but we, we want to always discuss the progression of Formula Drift and the future of it and the perspective of someone from Pro 3, like Corey, getting into Pro 2 and going to Pro 1 and and what it takes to uh to make it i think that we've all kind of uh had that discussion many times and uh aaron you've you've had some time on the youtube space and other video spaces discussing this you've had uh meetings recently at SEMA, like with Corey and uh jim and ryan and farouk has a unique perspective of being someone that has uh been through it he's been in pro 2 and pro 1 and i think in no mean terms, of course. I love Farouk, but he's had struggles throughout <laughs> his Pro 1 career, which I think you would agree to, right? To say the least. <laughs> so, yeah, we have, a unique, we have a unique perspective from uh, Aaron that's someone that is has run a Pro-Am league and someone who is a, I'd say, quite vocal critic of drifting. And uh, Farouk, who uh, has been on the ground experiencing it. And, yeah. Where do we begin? Uh, uh, Farouk also... Just a quick primer, also, by uh, the sorry. way. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say a quick primer. I also drove in Formula D a long time ago. Um, I drove a full season of D1. Uh, I've been around a long time driving as well. So okay, yeah, I've been so through all this stuff as well. But what but, year was that, out of curiosity? Uh, back in 07. And I also drove Nopi Drift for a full season and a half and then D1 um, yeah. for a full season, I think, in 2009. So I guess we have, uh, you've got a lot of experience in the uh, early days of driving in America. Yep. So, but I, I would not be in Formula D now. It would be too difficult for me. Yeah, too I was much say, effort. Let's let's start right there. What uh, and maybe people have seen your videos. Maybe they haven't. But uh, Aaron, what is wrong with Formula Drift? Um, first of all, that's that's baiting me. No, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't, say I don't, what's wrong with Formula okay. D? Well, we have. So to be fair, I mean, I, I, that does sound very baity. I don't want to sound that way. But we we openly have criticisms and critiques of the way we think. The, well, the way we think things are and the way we think things are going. Um, I'm just trying to not be a dickhead and try to say what you said online to give people an idea of what your position is. Because right. so, you have done videos that are out there and some have been removed for whatever reasons you may have had, but you are a critic of Form of the Drift, and I want to get your perspective on what you wish to be critical of. Sure, I can explain all that, the video I removed and my perspective and stuff. My perspective is I've been hosting drifting events for a long time, and um, I've been feeding people to Formula D as a licensing body. I've fed people to D1 as a licensing body. Um, I've driven nationally for a long time. Um, I constantly drive myself. I drive more than probably any pro-am guy in the nation. And my entire point for a lot of that stuff is simply 
that grassroots should be its own healthy thing. And I think a lot of people, especially in your audience, would say that Formula D Pro-Am has no other reason. And I think Paco or you said this specifically, Formula D Pro-Am has no other reason to exist other than to escalate people into Formula D Pro 2 and Pro 1. No, um, but not not, ex- and not all their purposes, but that's its main purpose. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think that's the main purpose at all. Um, I think that all of the grassroots events around the nation are to have fun and to have great drifting and you know be entertaining and everything else. And we have, like say at Lone Star Drift events, we have 100 caged cars. Um, split up between two series at round one, and then the attendance falls throughout the year. But um, it's very, I guess it would be very, I um, don't have the word, but it would be a bad idea to tell every one of those kids that they're there to get a Formula D license, and if they don't, they're a failure, or something of that nature. Because you're only going to have maybe one guy out of each Pro-Am series once every four years to find any real success in Formula D, and each year it gets increasingly difficult so that you'd be sending, say, one guy every few years up the ladder to try and do well. And most of those guys don't, um, not from 2000 and, you know, 12 on. And um, it would really ruin grassroots drifting to think that, you know, all the Pro-Am series need to escalate drivers. Because I would say 99.5% or more of the guys have no business going to Formula D for various reasons, whether right. it be um, they're not going to have the money to do so, they're not going to have, you know, whatever it is, the marketing, the driving ability, the seat time, anything else. Well, before and we go further, I think, sorry, go on, finish. Oh, I was just going to say, that doesn't mean that the Formula D pro cannot, you know, create awesome drivers like Chelsea Denofa and other people. They absolutely can. But over time, there's only about probably – Other people will disagree with me, but I'm going to say eight spots, maybe 10 spots where the people within Formula D actually get paid enough to sustain themselves and be true professionals in the sense of the word that that's where their income comes from. And they're not just pulling in enough sponsorship to try and, you know, make their series happen. Um, Or, you know, they're not just self-funding it completely. And... um, I got off topic in my brain, and now I don't remember what <laughs> yeah, it was. Yeah, well, let's, let's start with, I think got to have some definitions here. So Go I ahead. would barely call a Prem event that is a feeder series in a competition to be in the tier, the top tier drifting in America level. I would hardly call a Prem sanction, form of the drift sanction event, a grassroots event. Granted, there are a ton of grassroots guys there, but I mean, this is a event that has the ability to crown a driver and let him accelerate through the ranks. So, I mean, I consider grassroots events to be Matsuri's and fun days and, and things that aren't competition that lead to a career in the sport. So, I mean, granted, there is a ton of grassroots guys there that are there to have fun. But I think it's weird to yeah. call that a full-on grassroots event because I think we have, to dis- that's, we have to distinguish the two things between grassroots and professional intended drifting. Cause, okay. cause I, think I heavily disagree different. on that, though, yeah. because okay. I believe that, say, you have a pro-am organization in an area. Mm-hmm. So if everybody basically is there for fun um, or, you know, even with the intention of moving on to Formula D, if you have, say, seven events in a pro-am series, those guys are only going to be operating the cars at those events and they're not going to be able to go to any other events. Um, and most local areas don't have the ability to sustain, you know, tons of other events, you know. Matsuri type events, you know, pro am events, all these other type of things. So if you're saying a pro am organization is higher level than a grassroots, you know, series, then there is no grassroots in a lot of places. But I, I think I think I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, Aaron, but I think like the issue here is that there's a problem with terminology because, for example, like uh, let's talk about like Lone Star Drift. It's a drift mm-hmm. organization. Lone Star Drift mm-hmm. has grassroots events. And it also provides with a pro am uh, uh, event. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want, like, I don't want people to to think that, for example, that uh, that gra- that uh, Lone Star it's a grassroots only ev- uh, organization. I mean, uh, it th- is th- absolutely grassroots only organization. Well, I mean, so right. But, but, you, <laughs> but how do you how do you get to pro guys, two? Yeah, I would you guys say offer pro pro two is also grassroots, and no one in pro two is fully paid to drive. And up until you get higher in Formula D to maybe top 16, 
Those guys are still grassroots guys that are attempting to drive at a professional level. What's your definition of it yet. grassroots? Let's get down to the core. What's grassroots mean to you? Grassroots is anybody that operates a race car for fun on their own dime and just runs around and does fun stuff. Even with the intention of driving professionally? Uh, yes, because having the intention of driving professionally and actually driving professionally are vastly different terms. Um, so they're not against I each other, right? I mean, it, it, like they can both coexist. Like for oh, example, yeah, they I, can absolutely coexist. Like I could, I could imagine, for example, um, uh, Parson. What was what's uh, what's his name? Uh, Will Parsons. Will, Will yeah, Parsons. Will, Will Parsons. One of the one of your guys. Uh, like when he was uh, driving pro, uh, on Formula Drift, I mean, I, I could I could see that he was like a like a grassroots professional driver. Is that is that like do you think that would be a fair assessment? He was absolutely grassroots, and he was absolutely not a professional driver. He <laughs> well, was not being paid, and he had to have a day job as a locksmith at a school district to continue doing that. But so saying, by your definition, everyone but essentially the top 10-ish drivers in Formula Drift are grassroots. I mean, like, there's going to obviously be arguments about that, but I would say only those top guys are truly professional, and yeah. everyone else is self-funding it to a certain degree to make it worth, you know, like, happen. And yeah. some people might say the top 32 and everybody in Formula D is professional, and that's fine, because they are acting professionally. They are, you know, putting on race suits and going in and, like, signing autographs and everything else. Yeah. But um, I think there's a lot of guys that put in a lot of their own money and self-fund and have to have day jobs and everything else to do it. So <laughs> Formula D happens to be small enough at the moment to still be able to do that as, like, a gentleman racer that comes in and pays. And, you know, a guy has a normal blue-collar job and can afford that. But as, you know, things get bigger and bigger, NASCAR, you're not going to be able to do that. NASCAR, they still have self-funded teams, but they're extremely wealthy people that self-fund themselves. Um, um, so, yeah. so, so by definition, uh, I mean, if somebody drives on a professional series, I mean, even if, it's, <coughs> if it comes out of his pocket, I mean, it doesn't necessarily make him like a professional as in like he's a, a guy who's being paid to drive. But he's competing on a professional series. So, I mean, I would say just... Yeah, I mean, like, this is just splitting hairs. Exactly. You can say everybody... That's what well, I'm no, I mean, it's, it's important, though, to come up with these definitions because okay. of we, cause well, our, our, major, our major argument that we have on this show is that we fully support a grassroots drifting culture and a professional form of the drift okay. culture. I will and, say everything below Pro 2 is that's grassroots. Here, so you want to talk. Uh, no, I'm good. I'm just middle. listening. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say Pro 2 is the middle. Um, it's grassroots guys growing up trying to go pro. Uh, all Pro-Am and lower is grassroots in my opinion. And that's fine. We can all disagree on that. And then we can say everything Formula D Pro 1 is professional, mm -hmm. even if it's self-funded and everything else, which is perfectly fine. I think it's rad people self-fund. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, uh, what, I'm, what, what I want to go is that uh, at the end of the day, this is just like a definition that we are trying to give things i mean at the okay. end of the day is a, is the activity itself what matters you know like for example like i would i would say uh forsberg you know I, i think he's one of the most professional drivers but when he goes to uh local grassroots events on his ka turbo car he's being a grassroots driver right i mean it's it's like one thing doesn't cancel the other it's not like just stop being grassroots because you are professional Or, or you can't be both, or you, or, or you have to choose, you know? Like, it's, it's something that, it's, it's just a, a definition that of, of an activity, but it's not a definition yeah. of a person's character or of a person's, uh, a driver's uh, um, stance and, or status, you know? Yeah, and I'm worried about getting in the mud here, because essentially the conversation I wanted to have was just on, on grassroots drifting, you know, for fun drifting versus for professional drifting, but now we're kind of muddying the waters by saying some drivers are grassroots, some are professional, and, and so on yeah, and so forth. It doesn't matter so, to me. But yeah, well, I, well, would just, what, I would absolutely take contention with grassroots stuff as like pro-am. Well, why it matters and why, is a professional. I don't why I think it's, it's that's important to get to this position is because I've watched, I, I think, a lot of your content that you've put out, and it seems like you have the the opinion that form of the drift pro one should take a more grassroots approach and be more grassroots <clears throat> quote unquote friendly. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that at all. Um, okay, I no. think they're a large business that's run by people that don't really have, you know, like their roots in drifting. Um, they weren't drifters themselves or anything else. They're a business. And I think they should function as a business and they should do whatever. 
And a lot of the drivers now get into it as a business and stuff. They're not grassroots guys that came up. They're coming in sideways. I don't and think people, uh, if anyone's getting into Formula Drift as a business, I think they are very shitty businessmen. I don't think a lot of people are. are <laughs> no, but I think, I think Aaron's mentioning the organization itself, not the drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right, you said getting into drifting, but yeah. I mean, what. Uh, so um, I think that Formula D should do its own thing and it should be professional and it has nothing to do with like um, what I say. The only things, like, I could say some cool things that I think Formula D should do, like they should build an American track that's like a super cool Nitro Circus Manami. Um, I think that would be really cool. Um, I don't think that fits their model. Um, you know, I think they should have really cool media. Um, I think it's, it's, how do you say, like, it's sad sometimes that something like Ken Block with Jim Connor as an individual um, especially with his new Amazon series, um, might have more media pull than a professional racing series like Formula D. And that's the world we live in and everything. But, like, you know, it'd be really cool to have some some amazing media surrounding Formula D. Um, maybe let's, let's circle back, maybe. Um, if we go back into the topic of drivers and progressing into Formula D, um, I mean, what, what I'm doing in your perspective, seems in, incredibly futile, and, and to many people in my life as well. Uh, but, so do you think, Aaron, um, mm -hmm. and I, I don't mean this in a, in a contest any way, do you think uh, an, an American driver uh, can step into FD and become viable? Yeah, absolutely. I think that How? anybody that wants to do it can try. I think that it gets increasingly more difficult as the sport elevates itself year by year. And as it attracts more like very wealthy Europeans or, you know, people across the world, that it will increasingly get less likely that an American grassroots guy will come up and do well. Um, but but how, it's would still he, possible how would he? Because what's the, his roadmap? What's his roadmap? Because I, I, um, I'm, 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 I'm taking notes from this as well. Uh, <laughs> t tell me, like, I, 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 love, I, the roadmap, I love the perspective because I agree with you on so many points. I just yeah. um, I think it's a little depressing to just put a blanket statement where. FD Pro 1 is not grassroots and can't be, and nobody in there can be viable. Um, and it's just a completely futile point. Like, I mean, people comment on my program all the time. Why do you keep doing it? And, I, I mean, I have very clear answers of why I do it and yeah. why do I waste all this money. Um, I, I, I don't this – is, this is all just 9 to 5 stuff. I'm, and I still have my work shirt on. I just came here straight from work. Um, so it's – for somebody like me, I know mm -hmm. in your mind it's futile. So where can America raise or how can America raise a driver? That's my question. Because I know the rich um, guys from Europe will keep are... coming. The Japanese will keep coming. The guy with the Ferrari will come next year. All those guys are coming. But then how – why run a Pro-Am series? What's, I can uh... tell you from my perspective what I've done to try and train my newest drivers. Yep. And I can tell you just from – remind me that second part real quickly about how I train my own drivers because I'm going to get off on a tangent real quick. Okay. Um, it's just like any sport, as it grows, you're going to have more and more people, and the pool of people interested in being at the top will grow, meaning each person's individual chance is going to get more and more slim because they kind of miss the beginning. Absolutely. So it'll increasingly get more difficult and everything, but we happen to be in a sport that's not like basketball, where any inner city kid can do it. There still is a large like um, cost to enter. So you don't have to deal with that many people really getting into it. It will always be fairly niche. But you've seen all other forms of racing, such as NASCAR and F1 and anything else. You know, like at the beginning, anybody can get into it. You could build a dynasty that lasted a long time. Um, and then the door starts to close as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, because obviously your chances of getting into it are going to be more slim, especially, you know, getting into it when you're fairly young, when you're more marketable and everything else. Um, so that's my stance on that. As Formula D gets bigger, it's simply going to get harder and harder for the little guys to do it, which is fine. But you just the dude working at AutoZone or Discount Tire that absolutely loves it, it like it's just a pipe dream at that point. Um, unless he is so good, you know, he can somehow make it happen. And you still can in Formula D because the cars matter a lot less than in some other forms of racing. However, being a good mechanic, a good media guy, a good driver, a good like. Um, pit crew guy, you know, manager, all those things, it's difficult. 
And then also getting your friends to fill those positions for free is difficult, especially long term. But going down to how well, hold on, let's loans... can we talk on that for a second? What? Yeah. As long what's... as you remind me of my other thing. <sighs> yeah, freaking. Yeah, no, I will. Back, I but... get the to yep. how to train. What is yeah. what's what's wrong with any of that, Aaron? What's wrong with the sport being challenging and having only the best of the best of the best compete in it on the top level? Nothing. If it wants to be something world class and everything, that's what it should be. The Olympics should absolutely not be dumbed down so that like the slower runners can keep up. You know, someone that's not genetically as good. You're going to have only the most like genetically powerful people combined with the hardest working and the most talented with the best coaches and stuff are going to rise to the top. Um, well, I thought that's been like kind of your argument on the internet is that you think that it shouldn't be that way. No, why would I want it not be that way? No, oh, because I it sounds like you want. It sounds like. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, from what I've interpreted of your videos, your critique is that you want to have more of a chance for the little guy to make it big. No. Okay. Well, goes over. Yeah, I guess. I guess he's just. Um, I think, I think, <laughs> real quick, Damn it! That's a ten second on. tangent, and then we'll get back on something. I think everybody misconstrues like all that. I want pro am and grassroots level stuff to be sustainable and not have like the full pro two rule book and everything such as 600 horsepower cars with 2,800 pound weight limit or minimum weights with only Achille 255 tires and all that stuff. Like a lot of people want that. Um, that would destroy drifting. If you implemented pro two rules in the pro am, pro am would be dead across the nation and you would no longer have it. Uh, why is that? You would lose 80% of the drivers Which, immediately. The Aaron, reason why Aaron, that would happen. Yeah, sorry, just uh, you don't think the Pro Am rules are, or Pro 2 rules are being designed to try to help the grassroots guys? No way. You would immediately knock out every person that has a Miata or any other type of chassis that wouldn't work. You would increase the cost of running on tires by probably eight times because a set of Achille 123 S's is only going to last two to four laps on the competitive car, whereas something else might last 20 laps. Um, you would cause the cars to all break because they'd be fighting too much traction and creating too much heat and everything else in the drivetrains, and you'd make the drivetrains much more expensive. Um, well, I don't think right they're going to institute Pro 2 rules in, in Pro Am. I mean, that, that doesn't seem feasible at that did. level. Yeah, but, but I mean, I, I can see someday people... someday that could occur, I think, when the sport's ready for it, and, and once Pro Am is as competitive, hopefully, as Pro 2 is today. I think that as, as we keep on getting to these new horizons of competitiveness and quality of builds and drivers, you know, I think I think it may get to that point. We'll call it Pro 3 for fun. And in Pro-Am, you know, just so it's clear, like Pro-Am slash Pro 3, you know, as a, a feeder league and a Pro 2, because Pro 2 today is almost like Pro 1 five years ago, I think, in terms of skill right. level, in terms of car builds. So I think that if in, a, in what I would see as an ideal future for the sport is that it keeps on getting more and more professional and more serious and more crazy because i like crazy builds and and i can see pro 3 being a place where there should be rules of power and weight and maybe a kid in a stock miata shouldn't be able to compete in it but i guess that's where um, we get back to the root of what you consider a pro m event a grassroots thing and i think in a, a unique world or in a in a future drifting world i think a pro m pro 3 event is a competitive uh little league to what over everyone hopes can be is pro one and hopefully there's more sponsors in the sport that can support it and hopefully there's more money and happiness all, all around but you know we are not there yet yeah um i would say that how do i say like when you guys said that um the worth house team operated on an entire budget of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, i think a lot of people's misconceptions sorry what? Wait, who, who said that I think Corey did. He contacted the team and asked, and then he, like, there was a big thing on the Maximum Driftcast thing that went on for, like, hundreds and hundreds of comments saying, I was an idiot. There's no way it cost a million dollars. You know, like, racing is really expensive. Yeah. It, well, I think, I think it was just the fact that uh, you had said it cost a million dollars with surety that you made it seem like you had the inside loop that it was a million dollars, and I think Corey was saying that he, having worked with Bridges, knew that it wasn't a million dollars. I don't think he threw out a number like 250, because that seems yeah, low. Yeah, I think he did. He specifically did. That could be wrong. Um, and he said it was verified and everything. But I was going to say, just observing the team without even knowing, I could say it was way over that. Um, and, you know, other people came in and vindicated me, like Luke Fink and stuff in that thread. And, you know, they were saying I was pegging it low. But I was going to say a lot of people just don't understand the cost. Yeah. I and agree. if you want Pro 2 cars to be the new Pro 3, you're going to drive out every kid that doesn't have the ability to operate at a $3,000 a weekend budget. 
And uh, anyways, we don't need to talk about that. Let's go back to Fruk's comment. Um, Fruk asked what, what was the comment again, Fruk? Uh, there was a couple, but why run pro to pro am if it's a futile adventure? Pro am isn't a futile adventure. It should be fun. So like, no, that, that is, no, I, I, I agree that grassroots events should be fun. Oh, no, no. So no, one, the one thing to build up a pro am driver for pro. Yeah. yeah and that's, and that's, that's what I'm saying. Ex yeah, yeah, if, yeah. if it's, if it's, if grassroots, the way to do it, I mean, so m many people don't know this about me, I guess, from this show, but um, I run Sonoma Drift, which yes. is um, arguably one of the largest dr grassroots drift events in the United States. We run 27 mm -hmm. events with 50 cars a week. And Holy cow, it's a lot of events. <laughs> it is. And our premier event uh, in December, which is coming up, is two we had 220 drivers last year. So it's, That's it's amazing. a huge, huge series. And we don't do standard competitions except for at Winter Jam. And we do four uh, events, which we call fun comps and during the year. And we do, you know, backwards entry or parking or just silly stuff to just keep things exciting. But it's just more, it's more tangible. Uh, you know, the, the reason that we do those kind of competitions is because we do have extremely strict uh, safety regulations. And we want to have people that don't have a cage drive their car off the street onto the track and can compete. So that's mm -hmm. that, to me that's grassroots and my, my history in Europe from organizing events with uh, Drift GP that's now or that used to be Drift All Stars it's now Drift GP. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen all sides of it and I don't know it's it's the reason you know people have asked I think even in the comments they ask why doesn't Sonoma run a prime? Uh, completely honestly, we've been asked to. It's not that's not what we're about. This is grassroots and if I mean for 2018 we're not. If we will in the future. That's to be determined, but it's um, if you want to like if I want to help drivers develop in the grassroots, I'm not going to hold competitions that are going to limit people to say, oh, this is pro am. You're you're fighting for the pro, you know, fighting to be a pro two driver. You're fighting to be pro. That's it's different, you know. It's a different purpose, yeah. and I, I'm kind of curious if if you think that it's so futile to be to go to pro two and be successful or go to pro one and be successful with a tiny budget. Why run pro am? I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I'm just saying, what's your mindset in that? I'm, I'm curious more because from a personal standpoint too, I'm pro, I mean, arguably the lowest budgeted, lowest horsepower car in FD. And I've had a, a comical track record this <laughs> year. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. But it's, um, you know, just from from both both a drifter to drifter standpoint, and also from an organizer to organizer standpoint, I'm just trying to kind of get the uh, okay. Get the Good. I'll get started. started. So we host events um, across the state of Texas. Um, I've been hosting events for like 14 years, I guess, or something like that. Um, our events are two days long. They have an extreme amount of driving in them, a lot. Um, they have no qualifying. The competitions only take a couple hours each day because we have no qualifying and we use a bracketing system that puts everybody together and has everybody tandem like, cool. um, in each know, how, division. How, what? How does that? How do you bracket them together? Just, I mean, um, we bracket awesome. them off of the standings for the last year they were in competition. Um, so everybody that was ranked gets ranked up. And I have a YouTube video on this and it, ex okay. it explains it. Sorry, but I'm, everybody, I'm... since we have, say, 65 guys in Pro-Am or 70 guys at round one, um, we want everybody to drive, everybody to have fun. We don't want it to be two days of qualifying and then, you know, a top 16 and everybody doesn't get to drive or just a top 32. Um, everybody tandems in the competition in like a bracketing system that is more like some sports game kind of thing. Um, the guys that are the worst get to tandem the most before they get knocked out kind of thing. And the best drivers are at the end and they don't actually have to tandem and compete until everybody gets to them, saving their cars, making them not drive against the worst people at the event where, you know, the 32nd guy goes against the first place guy, putting the first place, you know, best car at risk with the worst driver, um, all this stuff. Anyways, um, so there's typically, you know, like six, seven hours of practice or something like that are at our events, open practice. So our guys get a ton of practice, a ton of tandem time. There's no, you know, only practice with no tandem and then qualifying and then only guys that qualified get to tandem practice and then they move on after an hour you know like our guys can easily get 70 laps in a day before even competition 
Um, we do a variety of road courses, like road course events uh, at a little police academy and then Texas Motor Speedway and then parking lots. Um, our parking lot stuff is the most popular. We hot lap it so people don't really sit in line. Um, we have a lot of tandem where sometimes we have like 20 guys tandeming at once um, in big tandem trains. Um, anyways, so we do all that stuff. And then to make, and we also run clinics and we also run like bashes, like, you know, just fun days with no competitions. Um, the clinics we bring out like Chelsea Dunofa to do like a suspension clinic and then also to teach. And then I teach and we bring out some of our program guys to teach and then we teach the new, the new guys. But as there's more events around the country, we don't really have to do as many clinics now because, you know, a lot of people have already learned to drive. So you don't have to baby everybody, especially with like a set of Corsa and new ways for people to learn in video games. Most of them come out already knowing the basics, which is really nice because it saves us from a lot of teaching. And then for your question about how do we train people for Formula D, um, what no, I do is... Not necessarily. Like, uh, okay, but keep going. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was going to say we take, say, the top five guys in our series and we kind of separate them out and we see who is the most serious. And then we take them to extra road course days and then we train them. Um, you know, doing 130 mile an hour entries or doing very complex track scenarios and stuff. Um, and then I also, for our guy that we put a lot of extra time into recently, that's our first place guy that'll be going on to Pro 2, David Mesker. We drove with him probably 50 or 60 days in Japan. Um, and then also he does all of our Pro-Am events and our Bash event stuff. And then he also did another, you know, four to five days of uh, road course driving with us practicing in Texas. So when most of the pro-am guys, uh, so he I drove him, like a hundred days in a year. That's awesome. Yeah. So like, that's not what normal pro-am guys do. Um, no. <laughs> if you I don't want know to when... compete, yeah, I was going to say, and if you want to compete against, and we also obviously acknowledged that he had a lot more money than some of the other guys and he was able to do that. So we knew that he would be able to go into formula D a lot more effectively than some of the other drivers simply from the perspective of he's going to be able to practice a lot more yep. in a much more aggressive car than most of the other guys and have a car in japan to practice with and everything else um so, so that's, that's the that's the route that's the, that's the route you're saying is somebody that can pr practice one out of three days in the year um yeah except you don't even need that now with the set of course and stuff you can get all your hand-eye coordination and you can come up with a lot of amazing drivers that get to skip the first few years of like practicing with, you know, just screwing with the car and not learning and all this other stuff. Um, where, you know, a lot of people for the first two to three years of their driving are just struggling with the car and never even really completing a donut because, you know, their car blows up every five seconds or they don't know how to set up the car and they're always struggling. Um, so anyways, there's a lot of really cool methods now. Um, but it's going to be very hard to compete with the guys that can practice that much because if you're a prime guy and you want to go compete against Chelsea Denofa and, you know, Reese, not Reese, no, and uh, JR and Chris Forsberg, those guys between demos driving in other competitions overseas, driving in their competitions here and driving in their fun cars are driving more than 70 days a year, probably. Um, so Aaron, I gotta be completely honest with you. You're making it yeah. completely impossible for that guy. AutoZone that wants that has that pipe dream of going to FD. Well, it kind of is because if you take 32 guys in Formula D and you think about like James Dean coming over, there's a lot of guys that are like James Dean that might not be at his caliber, but pretty much the same that you've probably never heard of around the world that could come into Formula D, such as Daigo Saito or Yokoi from MCR Factory or like Shinji Manoa or all these guys that are incredibly good that you've never seen in Formula D and they can start winning events. Same thing with James See, Dean and stuff. I so think most the thing of the guys. The thing that you're misunderstanding is that, that those guys, I mean, I, I'm not so familiar with the Japanese guys, but like the guy like James Dean, that is the guy at AutoZone. That, that, that guy works at a workshop. He works in his family's workshop, and he's just worked and worked and worked, and every penny that guy owns for the past 15 years has gone into that sport. I mean, and yeah. it's... Which you is, absolutely which, say that, and I understand that, and it's the same thing with Christoph Blues, and, uh, but they're, like, they were still air freighting cars to america well, you know and still doing some pretty but by working stuff with hard very large budgets. Yeah, but they're doing oh, that oh, it's now. not by it's... working hard it's it's by combining their efforts with a, another team member that's very wealthy yeah but that you but, know what i mean but that doesn't stop anybody from getting to that point i mean what i'm i think what we're trying to say here is that everybody can achieve that position if you work hard enough if you get the right contacts 
if you become a driver that is literally uh, worth uh, investing the money on. So you will find people who will pay for, you know, your airfare and your shipping your cars. I mean, you see it now, uh, uh, Odie, you know, he got his car, his uh, car sent to Japan for that, uh, for that FIA uh, drift, you know. And, and Odi is not, I mean, he's probably one of the most successful low-budget drivers in Third FD. Third place this season. Yeah. I mean, it's not impossible. I didn't say it was impossible. Yeah. I'm still running a Pro-Am yeah. series. I still think it's rad. Yeah. I'm just saying it's going to be less and less likely for those drivers to do that, which means they're going to have to try it harder and harder and harder. And James Dean is not like... He's someone that started five minutes ago. You're talking about one of the best drivers in the world that's been Absolutely. brought up through drifting for the past 15 years, basically. Um, but, it's, but, but it's through very hard work between for him, him and his family. 2018. Yeah, but through tons of hard work and not coming from a ton of money independently, from what I understand. And, and I think Kristaps is misrepresented here, too, especially in the... Uh, SEMA video, which I don't know if you want to comment additionally on the uh, Adam LZ one, but it, th it seems like... Yeah, sure. It seems like Chris from there... I never said Kristoff was rich, but he came into the sport with a lot of money to get here, which is obvious. And I never actually watched the video. Um, yeah. But what I said in the video was, is he is building absolutely amazing cars. His cars are world-class, and it is so hard for people to come and compete with someone that's already building cars of that caliber. And... The guy is a really good driver and everything else, and he happened to have somebody else on his team, I believe, the guy with the Corvette, that you know put up down a lot of money to get them there and everything and get them started. And um, he doesn't have a lot of money himself, but combining his effort and everything, how do I say this? All I was saying in that video is it's incredibly difficult mm -hmm. for, and I didn't even know I was being filmed at first. Yeah, right. Adam was egging me on. But... Um, it's incredibly naive for some kid with like an SR240 or something to think that he's going to compete with Kristoff's car um, when yeah. Kristoff's could yeah. be building those professionally for other teams and, you know, pumping them out, which I think is probably what he hopes to do. Um, it's, it's very naive to think that you're going to get your build quality to that level and compete on a worldwide level when you work at AutoZone five days a week and three times a month you go tinker on your car in the garage. Well, I'm working in AutoZone is a bad pro. example, but let's say he works at a fabrication shop and fabricates his own car, kind of like Kristaps, because he worked at a fabrication shop and fabricated his own car. Or Matt yeah, Field. Yeah. Granted, granted he, he certainly has enough money to ship a car over here and compete, but he runs, from what I understand, a very tight budget. Like He stays at Forsberg's house rather than getting hotels for his group. He stayed there for months. And, and I mean, yeah. I, I, he doesn't have any huge sponsors i think he's he's largely self-funded but i mean you, at least in the tone of the video the way i read it and maybe i read it wrong is that you had made it seem like that was not good for the sport to have no it's rad a, for the sport okay yeah for i guess maybe me and others had perceived that your angle was that that is something that is taken away from the quality of pro one i think that enough. some of that stuff is missed sometimes like uh the team in that video was talking about buying that car for uh, young people to come drive in Pro 2 and like Pro-Am type stuff. Uh, which, um, which, by the way, allow me, that, that was totally uh, mis also like misinterpreted because they were just like asking like what does it cost and all that. But uh, I mean, they, they, they clarify that they're, they didn't even draw, uh, b bought that car. I mean, it's way, too, it's way too much car. They still try to buy a good car for Brandon, but still, like, they didn't buy the car. They didn't buy Christoph's car, which, uh, uh, no, uh, I know. you know, just uh, uh, a lot of people still I thought that that was... I hung out with those guys for, like, yeah. five or six hours afterwards. Um, um. But, uh, but I think, uh, uh, sorry, um, I, I think uh, one of the... One of the, I mean, we, we talked about it earlier on Facebook on just like exchanging comments back and forth. But I think one of the things that we agreed on is that sometimes when we particularly are typing something or when we are talking, like you said, like you shoot from the hip, you know, like most of your videos are straight up, like, you know, you don't script and all that. Like sometimes a message can be misinterpreted. And unfortunately, at some point, it seems like, for example, what you were trying to say is that there's no way you can compete against somebody who has a car that costs two hundred thousand dollars where i personally i i mean that's what it seemed like that's what you were trying to say so i think it's definitely it's definitely hard 
but <coughs> it's not impossible because like a good example is that Odie again with his 240 uh, that you know the same old 240 that he had all these years uh, home built pretty much like he still finished third you know so it, it, it just because you have a very expensive car doesn't mean you have you, that automatically buy, buys you the skills or the hard work you know that just takes up the only thing it, it fixes is like the reliability issues and making sure that the car is going to drive fine. It still requires a lot of talent, a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, driving skills. And, and, and yeah, that, but you I know, think you're also you're missing the message of my part a little bit by, you know, like cutting hairs kind of thing. I'm talking about running a series across like, say, there's how many pro-am kids around the nation? Probably 700 or something like that. Um, I don't want to say that. If you have all the Pro-Am series around the nation, there's no other reason for them, or there's the majority reason that they all need to elevate themselves to Pro-2 and then Pro-1. That's not going to happen. There's not enough spaces. Like They need to enjoy themselves in those Pro-Am series and everything and not burn out after one to two to three years and not be able to enjoy drifting as a hobby. Absolutely. Drifting should be an awesome hobby that people enjoy, and it shouldn't be a burnout path trying to get to the D. Yep, and you've hit the nail on the head. Like it's, it seems like there's this, this path that um, there's no other room for drift events or drift competitions, so to speak, in the United States. And no, there that, is. And that, It'll be if we kill all the pro am organizations by running them badly, drifting will probably kind of black out and slow down for no, 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 on the grassroots level, that, and then it'll go back to Matsuri and bashes and like fun events and everything. The pro am thing has only been around for you know like four or five years, kind of thing. And the, actually, God, I'm so old, longer than that. Whenever Laughlin finally finished, which was somewhere around 2007 or 2008, um, that's 10 years, by the way. <laughs> God, I'm so old. So, anyways, pro am for no, the first couple. I mean, of you years want of that the, the, okay? Great. So the, the reason going back to what I was asking about pro am is why mm -hmm. run a pro am? Why not just run fun competitions? That I mean. If That's all I do is run fun competitions. We don't even put Pro-Am on the flyers or anywhere. The drivers simply have to know that we're a Pro-Am organization that gives out licenses to even know we do it. That's right. I mean, that's that's. The, I mean, that's that's exactly what this country is lacking in some ways. And I mean, it's in, in drifting. Um, I mean, you look at what we're doing locally. It seems like it's the same thing that you guys are doing out there. Fun events to just have fun. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's uh, is it's this kind of, Rook speaking? This is this is me. This is for Rook. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was gonna say y'all stuff is amazing. You, we need tracks that support drifting in the same method that allow amazing events that y'all do because that's something that's lacking most of the places in the world. Like East Coast Bash has that. You know, Club Loose and you guys do, and most of the other people don't have that ability. So how do you suppose that people get up in the sport? Like, how do we make it? I guess, I guess where do people go to get sanctioned to drive in Formula Drift then? Are you, are you saying that it, it is should... that a question for me? Yeah, it is. For me, yeah. yeah. I think that the current method is fine. I think that pro, otherwise I wouldn't be a prime organization. I think Formula D is awesome, and I think that um, allowing the grassroots like pro am events, excuse me, to elevate drivers is super cool, and I think it gives everyone a lot of hope and everything else. Um, does it I give them false hope, that. though? That's, I guess that's a question. Should we just have fun events and not even tack the pro am onto it? I mean, from Does a, from high a, this school is a, basketball and college basketball give people pro, like hope that false hope that they can all be in the NBA? I don't depends think so. On I think it can be, but it depends on which school you go to. If you go to one of those schools that is a feeder to, to the yeah. NBA or to college. I mean, if you're going to a, a drift event that is labeled as a pro am event, even if it's not on the poster, you're going because, hey, if I win this, I got a shot. You know, but... Yeah, is that? I don't know. Is that false hope? I mean, it, you look at. I'm going to give you an example. This is a this is a kind of like a shameless plug, but what we do at Winter Jam is we line up pros with grassroots amateurs. We've got guys that mm -hmm. uh, have budgets of you know their car builds cost them twenty five hundred bucks, lining up with people that have hundred thousand dollar full blown race cars. Some, mm -hmm. and that's that's how it should be. I, I think those those kind of events are lacking in the states and. Not there's no pro am hope. There's no nothing. It's just, it's just for glory. It's just for fun. Just for, I don't know, having a blast. And without without that pro am, I mean, when when I was in pro am, I took it so seriously. We ran it. We ran it 
like a race team. And I, I had very little yeah. budget. I ran on takeoff Daigo tires I got from Achilles. That's why I was, one of the reasons I was a spotting for Kenny. Uh, I would just lo- you know load use takeoffs into Jeff Wolfson's trailer, give him a bottle of whiskey, and he'd take him back to California for me. <laughs> that, that was the that was my tire plan for Pro Am. And you know, it's if if you're telling people like make it work to go to pro, they'll make it work. And you'll have those guys like uh Dave uh what's David's last name? Husker? Yeah. Musker? Musker or Husker? I'm sorry, I'm Musker. not familiar with them. Um but those oh, those guys are gonna dwarf anybody else that has that pro two dream or pro one dream. And yeah. I guess I um, you could rewrite the rule book in Formula D to give people more chance, but I mean Formula D wants to be a world class professional racing organization. Um and I don't think that they want to limit the cars so that other people have a chance, if you know what I mean. And it's not really in their interest. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of things in the rule book have done that intentionally to limit, you know, um, I mean, simple things like the subframe rule. And there there are limitations built into the rule book to try to keep it tangible, you know what I mean, to keep these cars uh, in some yeah. way they could do a rule that says like your tires have to last four or six or eight laps and that would change the metrics of the sport quite a bit because there's a lot of people in formula d basically everyone in pro two i think pays for tires except maybe kevin lawrence and there's still people in pro one that pay for tires and stuff even if it's at a large discount Mm -hmm. Uh, would that make the sport better why would you want to do that oh i I didn't say we should do that okay um the only reason i think they should maybe do that it's for ecological reasons of being like just drifting outlawed for some reason because it's too visually destructive in the right. future if you had like Bernie Sanders become president or <laughs> simply because there's a lot of events in California. And if you all remember like Long Beach um, Red Bull event when there was forest fires and everything and like there was ash falling out of the sky if any of you guys were there and they were drifting causing huge clouds of smoke and stuff, like a news crew could come out and just say how awful we were and then suddenly California doesn't want drifting anymore and legislates against it somehow. Um, that could be detrimental. So maybe like if we were a little bit easier on tires or something like that. But I don't know. That's not my problem. <laughs> well, well, I guess. So I've heard for the, the entirety that we've talked so far, like every every point that I've tried to uh, clarify with you on what you might have as a <laughs> criticism of a sport. Have you said that? No, I don't think that like what? What would you change about the sport? Because I feel like you've made vocal videos on the internet talking about things that you don't like, but what what would you like to see different? Uh, for Formula D or grassroots stuff? Uh, let's start with Formula oh, Drift. Let's start with grassroots real quick. So okay. in grassroots, <laughs> there's a currently around the nation, there's a burnout path for most drivers. Uh, they get into drifting because they want to be in Formula D or they want to be a superstar. They escalate themselves from the first year of learning into the second year into the third year. And by the fourth year to the fifth year, most of them are burnt out. Um, they're out of money. Their parents don't want to help or, you know, wherever they're finding the money is starting to dry up. And each year is escalated to more and more expensive. Maybe they've made it to Pro 2 and then they've got to kind of drop out um, if they've even made it to Pro 2. Typically, they become very angry at the scene and poisonous and they're not happy with drifting. A lot of them might have built like a Pro 2 car, not have been able to operate it or something like that because it's too expensive. They don't want to go back to the pro-am or the grassroots organizations a lot of the time. And we lose a driver um, where if we would have more simply like given them a fun time and made sure they loved it and made sure they didn't go broke and they weren't constantly escalating the horsepower of the car and the consumption of the car and everything else, they could get to the year five, six, seven, something like that and really enjoy mm-hmm. the sport more. So that is one of the biggest problems of drifting is it's very expensive and it escalates the expenses the longer they're in it. Um, and we run them out of the sport. So if we could figure out a better method of keeping them and making sure that they have fun, that's what I try to do with my Texas street legal series is I don't allow them to run aftermarket injectors, aftermarket turbo, aftermarket transmission. They simply have to pick a car from the start that works that they can enjoy. And they can't like modify the thing into a contraption that doesn't like, that blows up every five seconds. But I still, um, I still think, I mean, before we, we move to on, on Formula Drift, I still think that drifting, it's probably the most affordable motorsports. If you think about it, I mean, even the, the people who yeah, runs, who runs right. Miatas on, on just like weekend Sunday club racing, whatever, they still spend a lot of money. I mean, the, the tires are also very exp- expensive. They, they travel, you know, all over the, all over the country. 
uh, where in drifting you can you can literally grab a car, you know, like a little crappy 240 and start drifting. So I think I mean I'm 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 with you that we like nobody should like encourage or lie, especially you know like the the kids who are starting, into like oh yeah you can you can become this super famous driver and be a drift god and become professional like they definitely have to know what it what it costs what like you know like this is not easy it's hard it's expensive it's gonna cost you a lot of money but i think you can do that that dream should exist and i think that exactly it's not exactly it's, it's not about killing it but it's about like letting people exactly what it is and see who's who's cut for that you know like like i i'll be the first one to tell people like when i'm, I'm not i'm i'm not i'm no no authority but I'll be the first one to tell people when I see them like that they're like trying to go pro and all these thong, all these things that they're. I'll be the first one to tell them, hey, you know, like right now, just have fun, get seat time, enjoy the sport, because if you keep doing this, you're gonna burn yourself out and you're gonna end up hating it. But right. but definitely not. But I won't. I won't never tell them like, oh, it's impossible. You're never gonna be able to do it. You know, just hang out at this level. I would tell a kid that at this point, though, to be realistic, I would say that, hey, unless you're completely personable and intelligent and pretty, not, not physically, but, you know, you've got a good enough image, you've got a good enough image to uh, get people to give you money to uh, portray that image. And you think that in equal cars, everything equal, you could beat Forsberg, Vaughn, Osbo and Dean. Then, uh, yeah, I'd say go for it. But if you don't have all those things then you don't actually think you could beat these uh, dudes out there, then, like, maybe don't try. <laughs> like, you've got you've to gotta be someone like Matt Field that thinks he can beat everyone in the, in, the, in the entire spectrum of drifting, whether it's true or not. Like, you think you have to at least have the, the personality to believe that you are good enough to compete on that level because without that, I think you're lost from the beginning. So, and, 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 now, <laughs> and now move on to what would you do for, for a drift? Yeah. Um, I mean, unless I you want to, Formula unless D you want to. Really, uh -huh. Well, I was going to say Formula D is not my concern or anything, um, but I would think for the growth of Formula D, and again, I am not a person that really has much to do with Formula D or should be talking about it. Um, if I was in some magical world where my opinion mattered on that, um, I would think that Formula D would be rad if maybe we had like purpose built rad tracks. Um, kind of like some nitro circus thing or, or like monster jam type of level of excitement. Um, I was like, I've said I said to Ryan and Jim the last time and I've said it before, I was like, we should have a stadium drift event because that'd be so fucking sweet to have just stands and stands and stands for the stadium, which I know that maybe they've considered to some degree, but I don't know. I want to see it. Yeah. Um, I think that there needs to be some amazing media um, associated with drifting, which there's a lot of media put out by individual drivers but for all of the other drivers that don't have the media capabilities of like donut media and stuff, they're at a big disadvantage. And it's very difficult for new people to come up with like um, their own media at that caliber. No, I completely agree with that, man. It's, um, I, I mean, I don't, I haven't seen Lone Star videos of um, your drivers or I don't, but you know, that's, that's key when, when drivers don't have the budget to promote themselves. It's, um, it's, it's the responsibility of the series that they're under or, um, and driving for it's i mean there's a lot more that can be done on behalf of um both grassroots and professional series in the united states to do this if you take a cue from what people are doing in europe i mean it's they highlight the party they document what uh this lifestyle that we all enjoy and we all love i mean there's a lot more to drifting that we love besides the driving and i mean when you're in the seat and with the helmet closed it's it's an awesome feeling but yeah. there's there's much more in the pits and you know just I don't know uh, I, one of the things that so you talk about driving and right you're you're one of your drivers drove um, one out of three days last year or this year which is awesome that's fantastic and it's a fantastic day as a budget and the wherewithal and both in, in finance and also in in stamina to do that um, I, I mean I, I drove pretty much a handful of times between Texas of 2000. 17 and Irwindale 2016 um, and the the coming back to FD seeing that scene just in the pits and with the buddies and just having the car work finally I mean that's that's what we all miss whether that's on a grassroots level or on a pro level that doesn't change and highlighting that is something that like you said Donut Media and other great 
media organizations do, but uh, we definitely both, both you and I, as I mean, I don't know if you do it a lot, but uh, I mean, we'd love to step up as an as an event organizer to do more often and highlight. You know, it's it's. I think it's it's if if anything can be taken away from this is we need to push the the grassroots guys and highlight them in a way in a non competitive way because I think that's that's what's lacking in the states is that if you're not competitive you're if you're not doing if you're not fighting for something uh, you don't really matter in drifting in the media and I, I know that Grid Life does a great thing I know that you know there are, there are podcasts that do um, and videos that do great things but it doesn't get the same attention that competitive drifting does, and it should. Well, the difficulty is in making quality content that's unique and interesting to people. I mean, that's a struggle that I fight with every day in my career is what is quality content? What do people want to watch? I mean, it's there, there, there's a basic formula, I, I think, that we try to follow, but still, you could you could work really hard on something and not have anyone give a shit because it didn't no, and, hit the and, right and, note. I mean, it's, 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 all, it's a big question that we are constantly trying to solve, absolutely. and people I work with are being paid money to uh, figure that out and because they have a easy, not easy, but a reliable solution to what wants to get watched and that's very difficult to, to do. And absolutely. And it's, it's what people want to watch. And I, I mean, I've, one thing about my drifting career is I've tried to do everything in drifting at one point at, in 2010, I ran a drifting online or online drifting magazine called uh, worksmag.eu. Uh, we had great followership. We were around for, just over a year, and it was it was fantastic. But what we tried to highlight was those points that are interesting that maybe not don't get highlighted. Um, and you look at, I mean, you look at the guys that supported me after everything that's gone wrong this year. You look at Nexon tires or SGR wheels. You know those those products that you can highlight and that grassroots guys can highlight. And that's that's the beauty of it too. Like what what is what engineering points in these builds are interesting. Um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of points that we just we miss as as media rather than people that are showboating and just at the top of the sport. Mm. There's there's a lot of grassroots storylines that get missed. Well, Matt Fields' videos right now that he's doing a Corvette build. Granted, they are being shown the Donuts audience, which has about a million on Facebook. So, granted, there's already a large audience that is, is seeing those. But Matt Fields' videos are essentially just Matt Field walking around with a GoPro on a stick or a GoPro mounted and edited by a professional editor. But, but, you can, but you can mimic yeah. you can mimic those edit choices that were made by by the professional <clears throat> editor, and you can take the, the the GoPro footage that he did, and you can all make those videos. Like uh, anyone with a GoPro can essentially, and and basic understanding of some video editing software, can make Matt Fields quality videos. And granted, they're not going to get the views unless they're hosted on a Facebook that has a million people. But I mean, my first stupid drifting video of me sucking at drifting was made with one <laughs> GoPro as well. And that has led to this career and this podcast and all that shit. So don't ever think that you shouldn't make content if you only because you don't know how, or you only have one camera, like look at the dudes doing it better and look at the dudes getting views and emulate it. I mean, there's no reason why you can't make content as a grassroots dude with one GoPro and basic understanding of editing software. Real quickly, who is the most successful drifter right now at media? Like, Eyeballs on Turk. the internet. Turk. Turk. Uh, and Turk Mad has, Mike, man. All the way. Oh, oh okay. Matt, okay. I was, I was thinking in FD right now. Mad Mike is... Oh, FD. Oh, did you say No, FD? no. He didn't say that. No, oh. he said it in, ever. Yeah, but I think Mad Mike is the most successful visually. Second, for in, in my mind, second is James Dean. And James does a lot of his own stuff. He just puts a camera on his helmet and just goes drifting. But he doesn't have a series with, with tens and hundreds of millions of views. I mean... Look at his Facebook on... page. And look at his Facebook page and look at the views. I, I think you'd be really surprised as how many people actually follow James on yeah. a personal level. And it's... Um, I mean, he's... And that's that's completely organic. And that, that also was the help of, you know, series like Drift GP and other guys in Europe that... Uh, IDC, the, all those guys that... Um, I don't know. I, I just think it's it's... Uh, you know, when when I hear you say it, Aaron, I think it's a call to action for uh, both of us. I, I mean, I'm sure you do it, but um, we we need to promote the grassroots in a way that is maybe not promoted. Like it should I was be. baiting you guys, by the way. What's um, that? He did a great job. So, <laughs> what what metric? What are the views like per day or something like that on Turk? Uh, I have no idea. Just looking at Dean, he gets like 70 to 100 likes on a lot of his stuff. It looks like Turk is getting. Closer. I'm just looking at Facebook numbers. Turk is getting more than that with with a few hundred uh, thousands. 
So, I mean, I think Turk has got much more current I was just, engagements. But I was just going to say Adam LZ is a grassroots drifter and gets more than either of those guys. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He's, yeah. Got, he's got YouTube, so I was, Liberty, I was going to say grassroots guys right now are beating Formula D guys in online metrics if that's how you measure success. I mean, I wouldn't measure success that way, but it well, is just, definitely just, a phenomenon that is important. I it, mean, the fact that yeah. it's coming in with that YouTube streamer following is massive. I mean, that's something that uh, cannot be cannot be disregarded. The fact that he has that YouTube audience, which which the YouTube um, celebrity is, is definitely. Yeah. A, I mean, it, it does. Awesome. It is part just... of the it is part of the equation. I mean, you know, you can be very successful on YouTube and literally just live off YouTube money. And you know, like you, you are considered a successful YouTuber. Will that make you a successful drifter? That's a whole different thing, you know. Because Forsberg, being a successful drifter, he was still living in a pretty humble house, you know. I mean, he was paying... because he he spends all his money on race cars and shit, which uh, <laughs> <laughs> is not, yeah. You know, if he invested every money back into his uh, every dollar back into his program. He doesn't. Yeah, live I mean, so he's so. still a successful driver, a successful uh, drifter. But, you know, like, it's not like, oh, well, but, I mean, he doesn't drive a Lamborghini or he doesn't have a Ferrari-powered car. Like, you know, like, it, 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 I think su success is such, a, is such a broad spectrum that it's uh, relative to who is gauging, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I consider myself fairly successful and, you know, nobody knows me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it all depends on what your end goal is, too. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I, I, guess, I guess Adam, I, I've never seen any of Adam's videos on the SEMA one year in Aaron. But, I mean, I don't know if his end goal is to be, like, a pro one drifter. But if his end goal is to be a professional uh, YouTuber, then, I mean, he's accomplished that. And that's, that's wonderful. I guess it all depends on what your end goal is and what you would consider success in re regards to your ultimate dream. I would say that he just from looking at the outside, uh, did the exact same thing he did in BMX, which is he circumvented the professional route and went a different way and became more successful than everybody, um, which is kind of like what a lot of the Formula D champions such as Sam and Reese and Tanner and guys do, which is use Formula D as a launching pad to get to something else. Um, and then they find their success outside of Formula D, which is kind of a crazy model, but I guess a lot of people and other things do that as well. Well, I think I think like most racing yeah. careers, though, they can't be sustained for long periods of time. Like, think of all the guys in NASCAR and other forms of, of racing. You know, they're at their prime, and they have the amount of energy required for the sport for a handful of years at best because it is incredibly taxing. It is, you know, mentally, financially, whatever you want to call it. So I think, I think you know, it has yeah. a time span. And it's not crazy to think that, yeah, you would take a cushier, higher-paying gig after spending a couple of years, especially if you're a champion, after spending a couple of years in the sport. Don't Tanner and Reese still race in more abusive sports than this, such as rally and... Yeah, you could say, but I imagine together. it's more of a... I, I can't speculate this factually one way or the other, but I think it's more of a show up and drive thing rather than a run your team thing. Okay. So, but I, um, that's, that's all speculation on my part. I, I, can't, and I then can't say one way or the other. My very last point for how to make Formula D better is I think it would be... Uh, this is an active thing for everyone to participate in. Um, I was just thinking about because of the fact that drifting is kind of visually ecologically damaging, um, it would be very hard to get a non endemic sponsor that doesn't have anything to do with race car parts or like an energy drink sponsor that really doesn't care about much, you know, like stepping on anyone's feelings. Well, how ecologically damaging, difficult. hold on, do you have any, before we continue, like what, do you have facts that say it's ecologically damaging? Obviously burning no, no, rubber. I said and visually. I visually, said visually, okay. It's a big smoke show. So yeah. I was just going to say, most large companies spend a lot of mar like marketing money, marketing that they are green, Look. and it's going to be kind of difficult because a lot of companies say Tide uh, Cleaner, you know, the laundry detergent, or all those people in NASCAR have been in NASCAR for a very long time since before marketing green was a thing. So it makes sense for them to maintain like their sponsorship stuff in NASCAR. But in drifting, per se, maybe drifting is too small or maybe something like the ecologically too damaging. But I don't think there's any large sponsors outside of um, the endemic sponsors or outside of like a GoPro or a Blackview or an energy drink that have wanted to be in drifting. Like even Sears with Sears Auto Center, um, which was, you know, a car related thing. Um, there's also Air Force. Um, so anyways, they blow things up, though. Um, but 
I don't know if you'll ever get any of those huge sponsors into drifting um, until drifting looks a little bit more responsible. And I don't know if that's possible. What do you guys think about that? It's definitely something I've considered is the whole optics of uh, burning tires that go into the atmosphere and turn to stars. That's how it works. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it all depends on the optics of the company. I think that yeah, getting a big box, you know, so and so sponsor to sanction such a thing when there may be the optics of bad for the environment is going to be difficult. But I guess it all depends on how it's how it's perceived, how it's pitched. I mean, maybe maybe uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. If that actually is a problem, first of all, I don't know if that's what's holding them back. But if it is a reason, no, I don't say, either. I was just yeah. thinking about it, so I was yeah, I mean, you talk about it. It's something I've considered. I mean, I don't know them. Uh, yeah. If they if they said that it was what was holding back, like if Target or Walmart or Tide or one of these people said that they would literally um, invest five million dollars and do deform the drift tomorrow if they could make it look green, like I wouldn't know the answer to that right away. Well, I mean, just just think about it in a series like NASCAR, uh, open wheel racing. I mean. Forget about the environment. Let's talk about the risks and how many drivers have died in those series. I think that's mm -hmm. even like more. There's there, it has more impact as far as like people watching. Like, oh my God, you know, like Dale Earnhardt died. You know, like the biggest driver. But you know, like the sponsors, they will still kind of like part of it. You know, it's kind of like like they're not like oh maybe we should pull away, pull out from this series because people is getting is getting killed. You know. Same with Indy, you know, a lot of big drivers, you know, they died, but the sponsors stayed. So I personally, and again, this is also my speculation, I don't think the, the visual aspect, it's an issue until somebody actually states that. Like somebody says, ah, uh, you know, like, some, like, like, I don't know, Home Depot, you know, they say like, ah, you know, we're really not interested because the sport looks dirty because of all the smoke. But, I mean, we've seen, you know, like, last year, Matt Field brought a video game into the sponsors. Um, we it had, was Microsoft as a whole, but, yeah. yeah pretty... We had, uh, we had uh, people bring in casinos, strip clubs. Um, uh, All of those I are mean, kind of send industries, though, except for Microsoft. Worth House, uh, I, I think, what, that, what do they do, like, home renovation or something like that? Roofing, commercial roofing. Yeah, see, right, I mean, but that's simply a parent's company, correct? That, I, I don't know. Is it? Yeah, I don't yeah. know the facts. Yeah. All right. Well, well we, we we can find out just to make sure. But but it, it, even like I mean, uh, Andy Hatley's. You know, that's his family's business. Hatley's uh, furniture. Uh, small amounts, though, and in small small businesses versus yeah. the large multinational. And, and that's one of the things. One of the things we're talking about. Uh, for example, last uh, I think it was last episode uh, when Corey was here. His brother. He's into into sprint car racing. And you see, like, all these cars, you know, some of, his brother's car was sponsored by a jewelry. Like, they have nothing mm -hmm. to do with, with cars, but they've been there for years, you know. Like, there's, they see something, uh, some value on sponsoring a car. But they're not the ones. On they're mod. not the ones that are handing out massive money, and they're not the ones that have, have entire HR and PR departments dedicated to uh, yeah. being green-looking. Yeah, but, I mean, you know, like, a company like Target, like Home Depot, Tide... Like the the ones that you see on on NASCAR, um, I mean, if somebody approaches them like, "Hey, dude, like I have this program that it's only like five percent of the cost of of a NASCAR uh, yearly program," I mean, you might you guys might be interested. Like, I don't see why. I'm not. sure sure Matt Field has tried of all people. <laughs> <laughs> like I I, uh, I would love to get sponsored by fucking Tide. I don't care. No, <laughs> I, I guess I'll okay. Switch. So I mean the. <laughs> I feel that the sport is so young that it's it's strange that we're being so negative with everything, whether it's sponsors or whether it's drivers being pro um, going to pro or whatever it is. It just it's so young. It's it's wild that we're just being so negative. Yeah, just, I agree. You know, it's it, I mean, I I really I really feel for you, Aaron, and what you're saying about it being almost impossible. I think the question was because specifically I'm, I'm negatively living... placed. How do we make it better? It wasn't, what are my favorite things okay. about Formula D? And then I would name sure. all positive things. I think y'all specifically named, ask me the question of how do we improve right. something, but, which, which you, means okay. we are let's, only going to focus on the negative. Let's also, but, get off this, let's also get off this, it's attacking Aaron. No, it's not. But, but, it's not but, I'm not, I, yeah, I was, I'm not here for that. I, I'm here because Aaron is <laughs> an awesome event organizer, and we both have different perspectives on FD. So let's talk about that then. 
uh, Aaron, Real quick, what? it's it's when we've only we've only <clears throat> pitched it, quote unquote, pitched it that way because Aaron, you've made videos that sound hey. vocally okay. uh, critical of the sport. So we we really want to have you on the show to to talk about that because whether you intend to or not, you have created a stir online with people either vigorously supporting you or vigorously against what you have to say. So whether it's your intention or not to create controversy, you have. And that's <laughs> yeah. why I wanted you on the show to either A, clarify, or B, make everyone more pissed okay. off and angrier. So, well, I'm just saying I obviously like drifting. I obviously like Formula D. I obviously like D1. I obviously am friends with lots of professional drifters. I obviously travel with them all the time, drift with them all the time, go do cool stuff. Um, I obviously am a pro-am organization, so I obviously think Formula D is cool. I've driven in Formula D myself before, so I obviously thought it was worthwhile to spend money on. Um, I come about it from a different perspective, which is like the Drift Dad that has his own organization that has lots of drifters and feed them into the wood chipper sometimes on accident when they're not ready to advance on to Formula D. And then I get to see tons of people, you know, have to sell their drift cars, run up credit card debt. Um, I would say a lot of my drifters that have gone on to do Pro 2 and stuff have accumulated large amounts of debt that they have to pay off for a long time. You know I mean, like that causes a lot of like feelings inside me. Um, so anyways, well, we all do, and I'm, I'm not even. I, think, I haven't even done pro am. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's important just to live within your means. Then, I mean, if you, if you don't, <laughs> if you're gonna, if you're gonna, <laughs> gonna foreclose in your house to run a pro two career when when there's a small margin of success uh, for you to move on, then then don't do it. I guess. Yeah. And one other quick thing, since we keep talking about all this stuff, I obviously like Formula D. I obviously think pushing the cars is awesome. I obviously think that. Uh, world-class drift cars and world-class drift cars or like drivers are amazing. I like, why wouldn't you like that kind of stuff? I think it's awesome. I just want to see the sport sustainable for a long period of time. And I want to make sure that all the drivers in formula D and everybody that have put so much time and effort into it, get to continue it. And you know what I mean? Like not end up in five years in some weird place where everything they put into their life comes to an end somehow. You know what I mean? Like yep. I want everything to succeed and do really well. And that's why I think about if I talk about the ecological, you know, thing, I don't think that I don't want to get into politics and stuff, but you know, with a heavy right swing now, we could have a heavy left swing and we could absolutely have someone that wants to shut down like a lot of, um, it would, if they put a huge carbon tax on drifting or something, you know what I mean? Like it could heavily, change the sport and i want to make sure that the sport itself gets to live a long time so that's why i want to talk about this stuff right not because there's i nothing... want to shut something down or i want to put yeah. on it and our literal entire point of the show is to talk about things so yeah. uh, again if there's any if there's any idea that it was a witch hunt i assure you it was not no i just wanted yeah. to hear at least wanted to hear what you had to say on the record on a live live-ish show yeah. And funny thing, actually, every time Aaron speaks, since he's not on video, uh, Brian found a picture of him uh, with a Formula Drift hat. <laughs> he's wearing yeah, a Formula I have Drift a Formula hat. D hat. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, obviously, when we we try to get uh, get funny here. Um, I um, yeah. Like I told you earlier, it's not like we're trying to attack you or we're trying like. Well, actually, on the contrary, we want to hear exactly what is it that you're trying to convey. So the people who you know, the comments were back and forth between people supporting you, people against you, people against us. Like, I mean, you know, it's just a lot of um, miscommunication all the time. And I personally, my idea is that the more we talk about these issues and more we understand what we're really trying to say, it's just overall going to be a better, <coughs> a better uh, um, so, uh, society, <laughs> for the, a better community, a better, a better drifting mm. community, and everybody gets benefited from this. Yeah. Um, mm. Mm. Fruk, you shook your head. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it just so we're all I, I'm just yeah, no, it's good. Too. I'm just listening. Uh, I'll, um, no, I, I I think this uh, this conversation kind of went down a path that I don't know if anybody planned for, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean this is this is what I hope to talk about. I mean, I want to talk about what what you know. There, there's it's such a broad subject. <laughs> of what is what is making drifting good? What is potentially making it bad? What is the future of it, and that's that's one of the reasons why I think our show exists is to discuss all the many gray areas and the many possibilities of all that. And, and we're all fans of the sport, so I think that's what's important to remember. And we might have different ideas on how it should be continued, and and most of us now have no idea what that answer is, but we speculate on it because uh, that's what we care about. So, is what it is. Yeah, it's um, I don't, I yeah, exactly. It's it's interesting to see where 
where the, the next generation of drivers will come from. Um, I mean, hopefully they don't all come from overseas. Uh, I love I love my European drivers, but hopefully we can uh, raise some local grassroots drivers into pro drivers here. And that if I'm if I'm fighting for anything, it's to kind of prove that that's still a possibility um, mm-hmm. with with the budgets that are going on in FD right now. It's 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 pretty hilarious <laughs> that I'm running next year, but I am. Um, and so it's uh, it, you can do it, you know, and we'll see what happens next year. You need your yeah. you need your solid year of solid car, dude. We've, uh, yeah, we've, that's, we've that's seen we've true. seen you drive. I mean, if it, if if it's the car that's that's you know like uh, pushing you back or holding you holding you down, um, it's about time you know get yourself a the car that's properly built. Well, you just need to. I think yeah. I think for you can probably. Use agree i imagine that you just need to develop the car more which you showed up with a brand new car and it was undeveloped and untried and unfortunately i think that formula doesn't work out so hot yeah unless you uh yeah unless you have a, a really solid um crew behind you that you know has had previous experiences with other race cars but yeah and, and i mean in long beach we just I, i took two laps in the car and i said this it's thing doesn't ready. work yeah, yeah it's not ready and <laughs> so before uh Binning it completely, uh, just parked it, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, it'd be interesting to get Aaron's perspective on kind of my pro career, and if you think uh, what I'm doing is completely futile, or uh, you know, let's let's uh, let's see what you think. Well, you already built the car. I already <laughs> built the car, right? Just do it. Um, I don't know if you can sustain it, and if it means enough to you, and you already are in. Are you in pro one or pro two? I'm pro one. Yeah, if you're already in Pro One and you're already that far along, um, and you think there's an end goal that you can manage to get to um, before you go broke or something like that, if you can sustain yourself and be happy with your life and everything, yeah, do it. You obviously seem passionate enough that you built the car and you're that far in and everything and you love it. I mean, why would you quit now? Um, the difficult thing, especially like you actually might be in a very good position working in a racetrack that you have unlimited seat time to test your vehicle and everything else if you have the funds. So you could develop an incredible car um, where, you know, a lot of other people don't have that ability. It's funny because that's a, it's a common misconception uh, that I have unlimited seat time. It'd be, <laughs> it'd be fantastic if I, if I did, but because I run the series, uh, I'm usually uh, behind radio. But, no, that uh, yeah. you're right. And it's um, – uh, I appreciate those kind of words, man, because it's um, – I, I hope that, I mean, through all the banter that we've done, um, you, you're completely right, man. It doesn't make sense. Um, but I, I, I hope that my program proves that if you push hard enough, you can make it happen. Uh, I have yeah. been successful so far, completely. And I don't deny that. In Pro 2, I had some good runs. Uh, in Pro-Am, I, I felt like I, I could drive against anybody. Um, but as I went farther and farther in Pro, it the car limitations and the program's limitations held me back. And, and there you're absolutely right. And let's see if I can prove you wrong next year. Um, have you made it a business? Like, is it make sense business wise to stay inside formula D or are you self funded oh, no. still? I'm completely self funded. I work four jobs. Everything goes into this. It's- so you obviously love it an immense amount. Um, do you see the pro-am kids that are trying to come up, love it as much as you and try as hard? Or do you see them half-assing it? That's a great question. Uh, some love it. And some, even in Pro 2, you see half-assing it. But I think, I mean, I, I've seen guys in Pro, Pro-Am locally that are just, that are, that are clawing. And they're having the troubles that I'm having now in Pro 1 in Pro-Am. Mm-hmm. Just with bad car, or bad, just, you know, not, not trusting the right people um, initially. And that's, that like, what you said initially is, you know, finding the friends that are in it for the fun of it. So the driver's only one piece of a huge equation. And having sponsors that support you. Like, I had the worst year. It, it was a comical year. We, we built a car twice in one year. But then the sponsors came back and had my back in Texas. You look at, I mean, I, I'm name dropping them, but STR and Nexon and the rest of the guys, you know, the rest of the stickers on the car. That's badass. That's like family, you know? And mm-hmm. it's it finding people like that in your crew to to support you in pro it doesn't have to be a sponsor your 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 boy is your sponsor your your buddy that comes out to you and busts tires and helps you find tire pressures that's your sponsor and i think 
creating that that circle is super important, whether it's in pro am or pro one. And um, I don't know. I mean, this kind of went on a r- random tangent, but I think we I think we're on the same page. Yeah. Um, and again, I just want to point out, I'm actively developing our pro two guys. You know what I mean? Like we're trying, we're working on them, but you know, like not everybody that qualifies and get a, gets a formula D license is going to have the ability to move on. Um, just like, I'm sure you can vouch for that. Like it's not an easy task to move up to pro two and then pro one. And I think it's naive of a guy that's struggling in pro am to think he's somehow going to find his stride in pro two and then somehow find it, find a stride in pro one. Um, if you're starting and you want to be a Formula D driver, it's going to take probably no less than five years of self-funding to get through your first year of practicing and then your first year of Pro-Am doing well and maybe advancing on and winning, your first year of Pro-2, and then if you blow through that and win, you're at year three, and then your first year of Pro-1, there's no way you're going to be super successful that year. You're going to get beat down by everybody. So not until your fifth year could you be hoping to do well, which is your second year in Pro-1, and you know, find your stride financially and everything else where you're starting to figure out sponsors well and drive well. That means self-funding for five years at the minimum for the most part. That's incredibly difficult. And I've also talked to like – but, but possible. That, but possible. Oh, it's possible. Yeah, I agree. But like you're going to self-fund for like five years basically, which means if you're struggling at year one and you don't know how you're going to you know, make your 250-horsepower car – you know, win or whatever, you know, you're gonna have a tough time. And then I was going to also say, I have some guys in other pro-am organizations that contacted me, you know, like, Oh, Aaron, you know, like I see you're running a pro two clinic. Can I join? And I'm like, uh, not really. It's invite only for our guys. And they're like, he was talking, I'm not going to name drop or anything, but like there's guys that have pro two licenses right now that have only ever done five competitive events ever in drifting. And you're like, they might have done less than 10 or 15 events ever total driving um and that's crazy that those guys are advancing on so early when um that's going to be pretty tough to compete with all the guys that have how many events or like days of drifting do you think forsberg has done yeah you know what i mean like that's going up against some pretty crazy guys yeah anyways that's all i want no, those no, guys to good. know what's going on so they're well prepared because that's my job is to prepare people for stuff what do you guys cover in your drift clinics in those pro two clinics? Just so we can get some insight. Maybe if they can't join your clinic, like for, you know, the guys locally and, and, you know, in NorCal or in SoCal that uh, uh, need some, just topics. It doesn't have to be specifics, but just topics. Yeah. The, well, we've done suspension clinics and stuff and stuff. Chelsea came down and taught some suspension clinic stuff and that stuff. But like, that's not really what we focus on in our pro two clinics. The pro two clinics, We link like one of my pro-am events together. So we do two days at that. We take a day off and then we head to a road course the third day and then a break and then another road course to go practice. The first day was Harris Hill and another day was um, MSR Crescent. No, MSR Houston. And what we do is we take them and we specifically put them on something that's difficult. So at Harris Hill, it was like a three-dimensional uphill, downhill, blind corner. It was about Mm -hmm. 135 mile an hour entry for the faster cars which tests their gearing limitations and car setups and stuff quite a bit and like how to have wheel spin at that speed and everything else decelerating down into a like corkscrew. Um, so mainly through track design. Specifically, yeah. And it pushes oh, the cars in speed envelope and stuff and makes sure that they understand how to set a car up for wheel speed and gearing and everything, which is not something that, you know, a pro M event typically does and then gets their speed envelope up and a bunch of other things. And then just hand eye coordination time, and tandem time and everything and we we eliminate all the extra people at the event so that we can run the best five guys against each other and just keep changing order and then we have them all on radios and we have fake judges and we just sit there and every lap we tell them what they could improve upon and then whatever and then we swap their position and then run them again and then pair them up with the other guy and then run them and then swap them and we continually talk to them on the radios to get them to continually like we're their spotters and also the judges so that we can tell them exactly what we want and how to improve. And they're not there to just like do random laps. They're there mm-hmm. to specifically compete. And then the next track we took them to is a much more difficult layout that, you know, everybody struggled at, um, except maybe one guy, he was kind of killing it. Um, and it teaches them like how to keep the cars together over, you know, four days of drifting and how to just how to do everything. It's just kind of eye opening 
you know, working cars at that level, um, at those speeds and, you know, everything else. Because our typical Pro-Am event, like TMS, is about where we go fastest. We do maybe 100 there. Yeah, it's... Does um, Formula D go faster than 100 anywhere? Maybe Road uh, the, the, on entry, on entry, yeah. Yeah, Red Atlanta entry yeah, is They pulled uh, like 100, 103 miles on Florida a few years ago when they had the long... Yeah. So. Different uh, Florida track, though. Um, by the way, uh, real quick from the live stream, uh, people uh, have requests, people saying, like, please please stop calling them uh, prom kids. There's a lot of uh, pro -am, <laughs> pro -am adults as, as well. pro -am adults. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm old, old so part by the time I got pro Yeah. No, so, I'm... Uh, and that and that's that's true. That's completely true. I mean, I was uh, 31 when I started Pro-Am, I think. So you mm -hmm. know, I was I was young Tucker uh, uh, Sam's age, right? Hey, hey, hey. you old bastard. <laughs> um, no, I mean it's I don't know. It's I, I think we're all on the same page. We're just you know phrasing things differently. Uh, Drifting's possible um, at any level for anybody. It's just a matter of how hard you push and how hard you want to focus on it. Um, I think that, unfortunately, the scene doesn't highlight the fun driving as much as it should um, because the competition stuff is easier content. And that's not to say that that's uh, the fault of uh, the media. It's more of just that this was easy. But from an organizer, uh, what I've taken back from this conversation is that I need to focus on highlighting my guys. And I, I don't want to call them kids because – a lot of them are even older than me. I mean, we got a 65-year-old <laughs> drifter that comes, you know, he's been building his car all year, but he's he's a hardcore guy, man. He comes out to, you know, we have people buy season passes. He's one of those guys. So it's, it's, it is an awesome sport that we have, and um, it can be enjoyed I mean, in many different ways. I, promoting I it with the intent to just gain awareness for grassroots drifting. You're not saying promoting it with the intent to, to make drivers pro one level. You're just saying promotion of the sport in general? Promotion of the sport in general. Yeah. Because... Um, I, when people try to understand our sport, the easiest way to define it is by putting it into the standard of competition. And when you look at like something like Sonoma Drift or something like um, you know, Lone Star Drift, there's so much more to it than that. And um, what, I mean, if you look at Maximum Driftcast, you guys are one of the only people that really dive in deep and ask these important questions. The only so, drifting podcast that drives in deep into asking all these important questions. <laughs> Thank you. So and once, but like, once we get to the Instagram questions, you'll see like some of the really good questions <laughs> about underwear or. Should we jump in there? How long have we been? I think uh, I think talking? just about. I mean, I mean, I I want to kind of express surprise, and and I mean, uh, I I don't want to get in the mud again, but it's like, Aaron, I expected you to have much more criticism for forming the drift and and <laughs> it was being run because it seems like that's what i got out of your videos am i completely wrong in in believing that or or are you not getting dirty with me here like <laughs> i just expected you to have i'm being more... baited no uh, I, I i just don't i just don't understand uh, why uh it seems like any anything i've tried to uh discuss with negative form of the drifty things here you just said i don't think that way um I think that everyone pulls bits, like, even when you say something and then I kind of like, no, I don't think that's grassroots or, you know, whatever. We all latch on to what we think is like some semantic and then we argue about that and then we don't get anything done. Um, if I'm a pro-am organization for Formula D, it's pretty obvious that I like Formula D or, you know, whatever. Or it's pretty obvious if I'm really good friends with Chelsea and some other drivers that you know, I like something about Formula D or the drivers. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand why everybody thinks that I hate Formula D. Um, when I made that video that I pulled down, um, the reason I pulled it down was just I was arguing with Ryan and stuff a little bit over semantics. And I was like, I'll just pull it down. I don't want to think that, you know, I got something wrong. And um, it was basically over semantics and stuff. And the only thing that video really talked about was I thought that um, – the media could be really cool coming out of Formula D from a top-down method instead of everyone having to create media going upwards, which means all the drivers basically create a lot of the interesting content, such as the content that really humanizes the individual drivers. Ryan Turk through Donut Media is probably the most popular Formula D driver with the most amount of um, 
like community love and everything and one of the more marketable drivers. And it's because he took it upon himself, not by his finishing standings or anything that Formula D specifically did. He took his future into his hands and he created media with everybody or whoever created the media and they made that. Do you agree with that? To some degree. I mean, I think it was a bit of luck and a bit of innovation at the time. I mean, it started with Turk on Network A, which I had the pleasure to help out with near the end. I mean, I think it was a, a good a good concoction of right place, right time with the right creative people pushing for the right thing. And of course, Turk had a, a part in that. But I mean, it was innovation for its time. And I think that's important yeah. to say is that there can still be new innovations for new times. And, yeah. and, and, and that's not something that should, should make any other future drivers frown or stutter. No, and no, I think, but basically I think one thing. Was, go yeah, go on. No, go ahead. I was just to say that the thing that hopefully we all take away from this is that there is hope for anyone at any point to be the Michael Jordan, the Sam Hubinette, the Tanner Faust, the Chris Forsberg, the whatever you want to be in drifting. There's still hope, I think, for anyone at the yeah. at any level, which I think is a message that gets misconstrued from from this conversation that we've had. Is that is that there is no hope, and I think that it's important to no, know I that. I think there's lots of hope because you can take your future into your own hands with media and make yourself whatever you want to be. So what I, what I was saying is like Michael Essa won the series, but he is less, um, I guess you could say marketable than Ryan Turk who through media controls his message a lot better or controls his marketability or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so most of the success from the drivers was coming from, you know, like the bottom up, not the top down. So that was a lot of what the video was about. And I was thinking about how they could make really cool, like content on Netflix, long form, that dealt with the drivers and everything and took them through a journey and everything individually sure. and built them up and really made them human. Um, so that's what most of the video was about. And then a little bit of it was going to be about, um, I thought it would be amazing if there was a custom built track in America that took it into like some nitro circus Manami thing, you know, that was really cool. Um, that really pushed the sport just like BMX with a mega ramp or, you know, any of those things drifting has like, hasn't really had that yet. Um, and something like that could really take it to the next level. And why did you take that specific video down? What was the negative thing that was occurring? Oh, um, basically, I said, specific, like, my specific comment that, um, I should, probably shouldn't say this, but uh, <laughs> my specific thing was I pulled a bunch of people that I know, and no one had really watched the Formula D CBS, I think it's CBS Sports um, mm -hmm. channel TV show. And I was just saying that everyone watches the live stream, um, like the TV package uh, isn't seen much by the demographic of drifters that I know and everything. Um, and they said, that's not true. It has excellent numbers. And I didn't research the numbers, which I did not because I didn't even think to do it. I just pulled everybody and asked them if they had seen it. So I represented it badly saying no one watches the TV show because I obviously shoot from the hip and I don't state things perfectly because I don't write it down. Um, so I just took it down so people didn't think no one watched the CBS show. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think it's mostly, I, 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 like we said again, it's mostly semantics and like the way, the way we say things sometimes, which obviously yeah. I mean, in the position that you are, because you are a drifting influencer and, a, and a, at, at some point you are an authority. Um, you know, it, at, at, in, we need to be a little bit more careful on how we say things or, 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 well, yeah, how we say them. Just make sure that the message is conveyed properly. Like I, like I said, like I said before, I mean, I think you're a very passionate person about drifting, and I think you're doing a great job with your series. And I, I hope, you know, I hope Lone, uh, Lone Star Drift keeps growing and gets bigger and better. And, and at the same time, I hope every other, you know, drifting uh, group and drifting organization gets bigger and there's more professional drifting and there's more grassroots drifting. And overall, like, you know, we all um, enjoy the sport. That's, that's pretty much like our main objective, I think. Yeah. But it's weird, though, yeah. like, the, yeah, it definitely sounds right, right? But I mean, like, so, so in the chat, in the Facebook chat, like, there's a, there's a dude that we've seen him, like, on the uh, any discussion we've had. Uh, on our our discussion board with uh, you on there, people post like these like Team Losi shirts. Like I'm with Aaron. <laughs> like what do they mean by that? Like it feels like you have like this militant following of people. Like you said, like whether you intend it or not. In in like, I there's think this militant. Joking. I think they're joking too. But but <laughs> it's, it's like at what point is it not joking? Like I think you have kind of this group of people that want to shake up drifting much in the way 
in which some ways I negatively perceive the Formula Derp audience that want to see destruction of our beautiful sport. Like, like there's this militant group of people that that listen and and hold on to every word you say. Like the, in that video, that maybe misconstrue your ideas about the sport as a negative anti FD thing. And uh, um, that's why I, I think, think there's I- a lot of people that want it to be you know negative. FD. There's a lot of people in the community that don't like professional drifting and they think drifting like, ah, uh, there's a big difference between competitive. Like, for example, I don't think a lot of people understand because maybe they're fans of the sport on your podcast, like listening crew, whatever your audience, um, they don't understand a lot of the sport. They don't understand that there's like different forms of tandem. There's like competitive tandem where you're trying to run away from the guy and you're, you know, trying to screw the guy up. And then there's like fun tandem or demo like type tandem where the cars are trying to make each other look as good as possible. I think our show listeners understand that those are different things. (laughs) I don't know. I would say even at the grassroots level, probably more than 50% of the drivers don't understand that. So I'd say 90% of the audience probably doesn't understand that. And they don't understand that like you'd have a D1 Odaiba event and the cars like say, the lead car in D1 would automatically always leave five feet between him and the inside clip so that it would allow the follow guy to like come in on him. And like, it would be a best display of drifting in general. So like the, even the line (laughs) in drifting would change for the type of drifting you do. And you would be at different points on the track specifically to give the other guy more room to show off. Um, So I was going to say like, there's so many nuances to drifting and everything and so much like character to it, um, I don't know. It takes forever to get into that kind yeah. of stuff. But well, I, despite despite our misinformation that we often throw out due to having facts wrong, I would say that our fan base that listen to the show religiously uh, <laughs> do know probably more about drifting than just about anyone else. I mean, that's their. I just want to clarify that our fans are <laughs> are very in tune. If they can spend two hours a week listening to this bullshit, I think they know. What, listen what to you uh, pander to your audience. Hey, man, I'm just saying that uh, I'm guessing that they know the difference between for fun tandem and competition tandem. No, but, I, but I, I, I have to agree with Aaron a little bit on, on the aspect that even even uh, some of the bigger some of the biggest fans uh, get get things wrong, and uh, that's just the, the nature of the sport when it comes to the judging, when it comes to like the budgets. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's just like they even though this is a very open sport where you can you know talk to the owners of of the series there's still a lot of very uh d- different cases where, where everything is so uh, particular you know like so there's no like a standard answer for everything and you know like even even particularly on on the nature of the sport itself which is the judging that's where like you mm-hmm. can see uh even even you know on our audience there's disagreement so yeah i mean i i get what you're trying to say yeah no, I think your audience probably does obviously know what they're doing because anybody that would listen to a two-hour podcast is probably pretty in-depth in it. I'm have just nothing, making fun nothing of better to do. <laughs> but even at a grassroots level, you know, like we'll have a competition, like, you know, something will happen in competition and the people, the audience won't understand what's going on. It's because drifting is very difficult to understand. And, um, you know, obviously everybody doesn't listen to what the judges ask specifically from the drivers or sometimes it changes. And, you know, the audience oftentimes has a very difficult time keeping up with drifting, which is one of the things that probably limits drifting in competitive format from like having tons of spectators because it's confusing. And I have people that have been coming to my events for years and they still don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> right. I mean, that's, and that's not not one of the, it's like, no, it's, it's true. It's I mean, weird. it's one of the reasons why we even wanted to have this show go on because there wasn't an open dialogue. When we started the show, there wasn't an open dialogue about, what is best, what is worst for drifting, what it is, what's what's the progressions of it, other than public forums, which oftentimes got it very, very wrong. And thankfully, I think yeah. that, that uh, Formula Drift has taken certain uh, measures to try to make it more understandable, you know, with uh, having the judges in the booth to uh, to discuss calls and what have you. But yeah, I mean, it's yeah. still it's inherently a difficult to understand sport. But also, at the same time, like, I barely understand... NASCAR and F1 qualifying and rules <laughs> breaks. So, I mean, it's like I, you know, everything, everything motorsport takes time to understand, I believe. But if you, if yeah. you care about it, you learn. Yeah. Um, I think we should get into, uh, into Instagram soon here, but do you guys have more comments on non Instagram things before we get there? 
Are you guys ready for Not the roast? Instagram thing? Let's the do it. Uh, have you been looking, Paco? Is there some good shit in there? No, there, there's dude. There's like it's it's lit. All right, fire it up, Paco. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me start with probably. I mean, we should start with a with a big burner. Um, let's see. Oh, so Macho Man Randy Sanchez. Uh, who is your favorite street magician? That's for oh both. my god, That's for Macho both. Man. Yeah. Throwing out some hard questions. <laughs> Aaron? I don't understand the question. Favorite street, street magician? Favorite street magician. Okay, you got David Blaine's. You've got, uh, you've got Davy Cop. You've got Chris Ainge. Chris like, Angel. What's, what's your, I don't who's know your anything about street magicians. Uh, well, right, that, well, that, that answers the there. question. <laughs> all right, finally got you on something. On something. <laughs> what you got? Uh, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm old school for this for this demographic. I'm 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 a David Blaine kind of guy. David Blaine, Ooh, hell yeah! yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. blame, blame the Blaine. Great question, Macho Man. Uh, for Farouk from '96 Thunder Chicken, Farouk, what made you choose the new chassis, the BMW over the S14? Um, honestly, I needed something that was newer. Um, it's <laughs> it's funny. Uh, <laughs> so what made me choose that chassis was a sponsor that I don't have anymore. Um, but I just made, I, they told me they wanted a newer car and I, all right. I said, okay. And so I looked at all the options and I like BMWs a lot and it actually has a great rear overhang. So in between, uh, the rear tires and the end of the rear bumper, it has a, a big Delta. Um, so if you look at the two, um, other options that we were looking at, the 370Z or the GT86, um, the back tire pretty much touches the rear bumper. So if you're riding a wall, your your back tire is essentially on the wall. Um, and with my, uh, f- uh, <laughs> how would you say it, uh, flamboyant style that I was uh, used to <laughs> in uh, Pro 2 and uh, Pro-Am, um, I like touching walls. And so I, I was looking for something with a, a bigger crest zone, which was E92. And why should I made suspension? Uh, feel make coilovers, um, so it was an easy choice. We definitely had that discussion on the show multiple times about having newer cars in the sport to encourage newer uh, sponsors, essentially people that would back a current car. Uh, here's a good one from a long time listener, first time caller, uh, Iron Dukester, with a classic take uh, on a mm-hmm. new new question here: Who would win in a fight, 100 duck size Aaron Losies or one horse size Fruit Kuge? <laughs> Aren't yes, I horse size? This is for both of you. Yeah, you're almost you're like a half horse, I'd say right now. Like a mini pony. Oh, yeah, like a, you're like a small horse. So, <laughs> so adorable. <laughs> so just double that horse size or 100 duck size, Aaron's. In thumb right. wrestling? No, I think just general no holds barred uh, going for it. I don't know. Aaron's Aaron's kind of a scrapper from what, I, what this conversation is going. Aaron, there would also be 20 times like the physical weight of me probably to kill you. So this is true. I feel Wait. like. Fifty pe- wait, a hundred people versus one horse. Well, a hundred errands versus one horse size Farouk. Right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess that it was. Aaron, have to play Aaron, on. We'll see. All right, we'll see what the happens. The horse but... would just get tired of kicking people after a hundred of them, and probably. But that's die. what you would say. You know, they're so small that maybe maybe he could take them all, or do they overpower him? That's why it's a question that's really important for. Oh, wait, say. maybe I read that wrong. I was thinking. Oh, so I would be really small. Yeah, like hundred duck, duck size. Oh, sorry. Duck size errands. I was thinking something else. Yeah, no, the horse would just stomp on them all. You would think, but what if he gets tired? And like, what if you guys are scrappy ducks and you climb like on, on the neck and like go for the eyes and stuff? Like, it's just it's just a really good question. Is is what I'm trying to get at. <laughs> yeah, I need to pay closer attention when it's asked. Yeah. All right. Cool. I'm actually. Uh, um. I'm. I'm gonna call out Aaron because. He already went on Instagram and responded to all the questions <laughs> pointed at him. Aaron, well, that was when you had me on hold for like 45 minutes. So I just sat there and did that. That's yeah. breaking the rules, Aaron. <laughs> like every question well, from him, he already replies. So thanks, Aaron. Like you stole the show. Oh, man. <laughs> well, I, here's one from Seth Wright. Aaron, are you top or huh? bottom? Oh, my God. Dude, Aaron. Uh, I mean, Seth. I'm sorry. Seth. Well, he means top bunk or bottom bunk. Yeah. So when you get bunk bed, <laughs> like... Can you check your pockets? Yeah, I can check my pockets. <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, let's see. A uh, question from 666 Drifter. Is the El Camino a truck or a car? Asking for a friend who is unsure if they're a man or a woman. 
Can I just take the battery? I'm going to. But Hold on, Farouk. Farouk's having a discussion. Farouk, what are you talking about? I'm talking to my roommate because his alarm is going nuts. My my roommate is a uh, fellow drifter, okay. and his 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 F-150 is parked in front of the house, and it's going nuts. Like the he's like, "Are you sitting on my truckies? Like, Where are you? No, no. no. <laughs> well, if someone's if someone's stealing it, we can mobilize people uh, in the area. So right? uh... <laughs> get Instagram, get Instagram on that. All right, Paco, what was the question? All right, so question by 666 Drifter. Is the El Camino a truck or a car? Farouk? Uh, that is, hold on. Um, so in nine, uh, there's actually a real answer to this. Oh. Uh, in 19, what was it? So the El Camino was made for two years, and then it was switched, uh, and then it didn't, wasn't made for two, uh, four years, and in 1964 it came back as a unibody. So before... For two years, it was a truck, technically, because it was on a truck chassis, and then they switched over to a unibody, if I'm right. No, because it was on uh, an Impala chassis yeah, originally. which so is that, a unibody. That was a first. Oh, no. That was, uh, so it was unibody and then went to truck? All right. Well, back. As you guys know, this show is also known as Shitting on Chevys. Oh, here so, we go. Shitting on Chevys. Yeah. I'm going to go with car on that. Yep. It's a, it's a you know, I'm going to go with car on that. Aaron, what do you think? I am woefully unqualified for this. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you already answered all the qualified, uh, all the, all the uh, uh, questions. <laughs> no, it's obviously a car. It's based off of a car, and they just stuck a pickup bed on it. There you go. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. It's a G-body. A G-body is a car. Am I correct? Yep. Yeah. Oh, then there you go. Perfect. They just basically took the trunk lid off. Let's see. Uh, uh, we got one from RTP Photography. Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong one I'm looking at. Sorry, RTP. Uh, Alan Bryant says, for Farouk, why do you use coffee cans as wheel spacers? Uh, because I ran out of um, Real gasoline barrels. <laughs> What's that? Because I ran out of gasoline barrels. You ran out of gasoline barrels? Okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's from the Haitley School of uh, Wide uh, Body BMWs. Yeah. Uh, some wheel spacers. No, I, um, yeah. <laughs> There's no, there's no good answer to that question. Yeah, but I mean, you throw on you throw on big wheel spacers to add track width to your car. Uh, yeah. So we, with the way that everything got, uh, with everything, the way that everything planned out this year, um, just we didn't expect the car to be as wide as it was. Mm -hmm. And um, at first, um, you know, it just we we couldn't get the wheels to fit, so we got some big old wheel spacers and we made the wheels fit. Yeah, and how does that change handling of the car? Uh, you lose a lot of side bite, um, yeah. and then the car becomes a lot looser. Um, but then you know we're working on things for next year. So, <laughs> but I mean that's I think it's important to address the questions because it, it was something that was definitely standoutish about your car is having. Oh no, it was hilarious. We had the... people taking pictures. I like I brought the wheel spacers out and we took pictures with them at Long Beach, and it's it's fun. I mean it's yeah. we we make things work, and we. We make things work, and we make a lot of mistakes as well. And along the way, we'll laugh at ourselves as much as other people laugh at us. So. Yeah, that's awesome, I mean, I, we got to get the uh, got to get it from the Farouk horse's mouth. Get it? <laughs> that's a uh, hey, hey, hey. Uh, Paco, what you got? Yeah, a question from Noodle Powers. Aaron, will you be keeping the the Jagger system for no qualifying in Lone Star? Um, we don't exactly use the Jager system. We just use the qualifying part of it, which has no qualifying, which I hate qualifying, and I think qualifying is super boring. Um, and it like makes events run much slower, and we have a two-day format and don't want to slow it down. So we didn't use the other things of the Jager system, which are the more Jager thing. We basically just use the part where there's no qualifying. Um, so, yeah, we'll keep doing that. <laughs> I would not put qualifying back into the events because it slows them down and makes them horrific to watch for spectators. Yeah, I, I personally I like that. You like qualifying? No, I, I like that, that you guys don't do qualifying. Oh, yeah. I just think, uh, especially on two-day events, it can be tedious for spectators to sit through you know, three hours of qualifying or something like that. I mean, when we have 100 cars at round one, I mean, like that would take a really, really long time to qualify. And, uh, yeah. I'm not a Everybody loves fan of not qualifying. Having... Yeah, I'm not a fan of, uh, I wouldn't be a fan of driving it, nor do I recommend watching it, but I think that sometimes it's kind of essential for a fair playing field. Playing devil's I, advocate. I, In a personal world, I, I would get rid of all qualifying, but I mean, as a, as a 
driver for Formula series, D, no, not... I think you should have it in professional series like that. Everything else, people are coming from around the world to compete on a competitive format. Yeah, no, have it there. Uh, mm. Grassroots, like Lone Star stuff, is quite different. All okay. right, what else we got? TSW busted ass hatch 408. <laughs> Farouk, will <laughs> you ever attend a marina event? And are you going to run Winter Jam in the Prios this year? <laughs> What's uh, so I, I think a marina event is the Drift Central events, uh, if he's referring to that. Uh, I've, I've been there once this year, and we're actually going to go last weekend, and we ended up going somewhere else. Um, May in December. Uh, they're awesome events run down in Monterey at the Marina Airport, and it's uh, just a big skid pad that people can come have fun at. But in winter at Winter Jam, I'll actually be driving the E92. Um, I'm creating a like a radio system that links into the track radio system, so if I'm not on the radio screaming at people, I can actually drive and scream at people at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one, this one, Aaron already answered on the Instagram, but I think it's pretty funny. Uh, Trey is Taylor. Trey is Taylor. For Lozy, what gives you the fucking right? Aaron <laughs> responds, I don't understand the question. <laughs> yeah, if he would have updated that, I would have answered it. Uh, so, going uh, back one minute for my thing, I just wanted to make sure people know I did steal that qualifying, no qualifying thing from DeJager. So I, I was thinking I answered that a little bit oddly. Um, I just didn't use all of his stuff. But I, I definitely stole that one thing from Chris. But... Uh, for the what gives me the right, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an inside joke on the show. We've got a lot of uh, really dumb inside jokes in the show, and that's oh, one okay. of them. So uh, I just I just enjoyed the fact that that the he asked it, and you're like, I do not understand. <laughs> that's what you get hey. for trying to answer the questions before we get to them, Aaron. Uh, can we take a, wait? Can we can we take a slightly serious tangent so you can can we explain the Krista Jager format? Sure. Sure. Yeah, we we actually have an entire episode dedicated to it early on in the show's life, but let's get uh, let's go into it real quick. What it is here, Karen? I think there's no one more qualified than you to discuss it. Oh, I uh, I researched all this a long time ago, and I don't remember anymore. Perfect. <laughs> I just to just to give you an example of how much like thought goes into these things that people don't think I think about. So like when I wanted to use the Krista Jager system, I went, well, I wanted to research it to steal one specific thing from it. I went all the way to Australia. I went to a drift event there that he was a part of. Um, I spent an entire week in Australia just so I could implement it as painlessly as possible, taking exactly the parts of it I wanted. And I had previously met him in Japan and sat down and he told me everything about it. And then I went to one of his events, I think the first one that they threw, so I could see all of the troubleshooting things to get them out of the way for my events. And then I took the specific things that I wanted, um, which was the qualifying method. And he had a bunch of other things, which had something to do with, oh, God, I wish I knew. Because I, I very carefully thought about all this. It had something to do with uh, leading and uh, I, I don't. Man, I wish I remembered. If only you had your notes, like uh, like Ryan Lofton. <laughs> yeah, it had something to do with the way you led and followed. And um, oh, I remember. So if you did not give a a good lead run that was clean for the other guy to follow, regardless of how good your like your next run was, the other guy would win because you're not giving the other driver the ability to win. And then they had a scoring system on all that and everything. Um, so we implement some of that stuff as more common sense stuff, but I think he was much more strict on it in the, the DeJager method. Um, Chris is an amazing driver and he definitely knows what he's doing. Um, I just remember that some of the specific rules would be very difficult for my guys to implement because we have, you know, three judges and grid and all of these things. And we want to have very specific, um, easy to run formats. So I didn't adopt everything. I basically stole the easiest, best parts of it to make the event more entertaining. Um, whereas I think he had very specific views that kept him from running in Formula D, he said, that he didn't like some of the judging um, and just wanted to change the way the judging went for more of his own style, which is awesome that he went through all the effort to think. It was very well thought out. Mm. Um, we should all go read it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, It's, it's been four system. or five years, so I just yeah. don't remember. Yeah, fair enough. It's better to uh, not say anything than misrepresent. Uh, but yeah, check out the Diego system. Yeah. And yeah, we do talk to him on some early episode of this podcast. I just don't remember the exact rules myself either. 
he's one of those super passionate guys that's rad with drifting. So like he's worth talking to. Uh, here's one that I'm sure that this kid didn't intend for us to actually read, but I'm going to read it because uh, I hate when people make uh, internet comments and then don't uh, expect people to look at them. Uh, Driftset716 says, Farouk, why do you keep on wasting money driving FD when you clearly can't hang? <laughs> <laughs> so, Driftset716, you, you obviously intended this to be a dick and uh, not have him answer it, but Farouk, let's get down to it. Why do you keep driving? Um, because I know I can. Um, and I know I'll get there. Um, in in my previous driving experiences, um, I had confidence and I had swagger and I had all that that is needed in FD, and I haven't gained it yet in the past two years. And that's when people have been looking, which is a funny thing. And if uh, if one dude, like we talked about before, if one dude sees that I can do it and I'm doing it. Um, and pursues his dream and works for jobs and gets there made it all worth it yeah you excellent yeah you've and been. and because i imagine despite all of uh, the hardship you still have fun on some level no doubt or you just are Tex- glutton for punishment one of the two <laughs> uh texas this year uh sorry i got my cackle out you yeah, know it's um, good uh, texas this year was actually one of the most fun events i've ever had uh, we were i uh, I have two buddies on my team now, uh, Vadim Tudorov and um, Eugene Fagelman, and they're and Pez was spotting for me. Which he actually used to be a mechanic a couple of years back, and we just had fun. It was we figured out the car quickly, and we were just having fun. And the car, uh, the alternator went out against Turk, which sucks, but um, yeah. we we were having a blast. We were laughing and joking, and it was back to grassroots, back to just having my buddies there and just having fun. Yeah, that's awesome, and I uh, cannot wait until you do get that right formula dialed in for Formula Drift and to see you kick ass. And then, and then I'm sure that one battle, if that's all it is, it will be all worth it, everything you've done thus far, right? Exactly. Uh, Paco, you got one? Um, question from Max Froelich. Uh, I guess this is from, for Aaron. Uh, what are your thoughts on Canadian drifting? Oh, yeah. So I travel all around the world constantly going to events and checking them out, trying to steal ideas and figure out what makes good events. Like I went to Grid Life this year. I've been to Japan multiple times. I went to a D1 street legal event. Um, I go do all kinds of stuff. Um, And I went to Canada and Canada was a very different experience. Um, The particular track that we went to was like a motorcycle track from like the 70s, maybe. So it wasn't really a car road course. Um, because it got way too narrow and some other things in some places. Um, The drifting was very dictated by, like, rust. So, like, no old chassis were left. Um, It was basically all, like, newer E46s that were already starting to rust. Um, All the S chassis were basically gone. They were very rare. (laughs) All the R32s were very rare. It was mostly newer stuff. Um, A lot of very different weird builds. Um... Literally out of 100 drivers, only two guys ran with uh, new tires. Um, Damn. So awesome. everybody was on used tires. There was a lot of very interesting cars. Like um, there was a Viper engined S2000, and he ran on all like used 205s. Nope. Um, so like, you know, some <laughs> very interesting cars. Well, I mean, like the car worked and everything. Um, but it was, and I think it was a competition car that maybe he used bigger tires on at some point. But like, it was on all stock rear suspension as well. All, all arms were stock. The, you know, the shocks were stock. The springs were stock. Um, but had a Viper engine in it. So like, they built cars very differently. Um, it wasn't anything that I would expect. Like, you wouldn't see any of the stuff there at like a Texas event. Like, so you get the flavor of like when you go to Japan, it's all like where we drive. Typically, everything is something that could either be bolted on because they don't have any access to, like, real garages to fabricate stuff. Um, So everything's, like, super simple builds for the most part in Japan. You don't see any real engine swaps unless you get to, like, D1. Most of the cars have to be, like, driven on the street. Um, You know, it's like, as you travel around the world, everything's very awkward. Like, not awkward, like, just different. So... In Australia, it's much like Texas or, you know, like, the United States where everything has a swapped in motor because everyone can fabricate and everyone has a garage for the most part. Um, 
So the cars were pretty wild. Anyways, Canada was very different. That's all. <laughs> it was like it was like drifting in the United States, you know, like 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I it like all cool. the. Uh, it was just different. Yeah, I like all the uh, Canadian fans when we've gone up there for Formula Drift. They're uh, yeah. different kind of madness. Like I like the madness that goes on in Formula Drift yeah. Atlanta, but they remind me of the Atlanta crowd, but just Canadian versions of themselves. And just to stipulate, I was at Shannonville, which is a very different type of track than a lot of the other places. So um, it was cool, though. And the community was awesome. Everyone was so friendly, which is awesome because it's always like that everywhere. It's just mm-hmm. cool to see the very different types of builds with, you know, all used tires. And it was yeah. very different. Car weirdos from around the world. <laughs> yep. Everybody loves the same stuff. <laughs> I have um, actually a kind of like a question and comment. Uh, pretty interesting. I, I wish Corey was here because he would understand this and have some good input. But uh, this is uh, our buddy Caleb Quenbeck is asking, uh, why not offer classroom sessions to program drivers to teach them the importance of personal marketing and media and, uh, and how to execute? That's a great me, question. Obviously. So I, I do, and we have already done classes. Um, it's typically an invite-only basis for the people that I think are capable of doing it. Um, and then after a while, I got sick of, you know, individually telling everybody. So I made a YouTube video about how to kind of market, you know, like what platforms are good, how Facebook views aren't real, you know, like not real, but like, you know, they have maybe one eighth the power of a single YouTube view. And like, there was no metrics before, but you know, like most of the views are like, you know, people scrolling through their feed. So you start to understand like metrics and numbers and like what platform is paying you or like you can go in and like. Um, figure all of that type of stuff out for yourself. And so we teach people that kind of stuff and like try to teach them what direction to go. And then we kind of also tell them how like time intensive it is to do that stuff. And it's probably just better to get a job. Um, the person that's asking the question is a YouTube star who makes his living just off of YouTube. So he's a great example of someone um, like Taylor Ray or anyone else who got into drifting through, say, BMX or some other way and already has a lot of, like, media power. Um, how do I say all that? <laughs> so they're, they're, they're very successful, much more so than, like, a grassroots driver who concentrated on just drifting, and they circumvented the normal pro-am path. Um, and they found good success where they are basically professional drifters without even having to go into Formula D or anything they already derived their main income directly off of that, um, which is really cool. It's so cool that the grassroots scene can sustain drivers like that um, without having to travel the world and you know build the most aggressive race cars in the world and everything else. And they're simply entertainers with an audience. Yep. Yeah, and I think I think uh-huh. that people of all levels and all aspirations of the sport have a place, which. Uh... From grassroots to pro, I think that it's good to have diversity among all the drivers, regardless of what your goal is. Yeah. Sam, I think you nailed the, the mantra of this whole uh, podcast on his head. So. We like everyone. <laughs> do, everyone should do the thing, whatever that thing is, and uh, do it the best you can, even if you suck at it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, absolutely. No, definitely, it's, it's a sport that allows you to have fun. I mean... What was the last time you had fun like uh, lifting weights, or? <laughs> well, wow, that's a terrible example, Paco. <laughs> I know, what does that I even know mean? it's bad. Um, no, but what I'm saying, I mean, it, even if you're not competing, like just driving and having like having fun with your friends, you know, it's not like like with all other other sports require you more dedication in order to actually play the sport. Where where drifting, it seems like it. You can just go and jam and you know have fun with your friends, and you're allowed to do that. And there's events just for that, for having fun. But that still requires a shit ton more dedication than going out and playing baseball. I mean, oh, absolutely. You got to buy absolutely. a car and maintain you have, it. But you have to be passionate, and that's a, that's a cool thing about it. That is, it's a sport that is fun, but it's for passionate people. Like if you don't have the the patience of dealing to, of, to deal with a uh, you know old car that keeps breaking, I mean, you're never gonna have fun. So passionate, right. passionate patience is what you need, Paco, right? Passion is the trip piece. <laughs> you need passion, passion. Um, patience, and... Uh, um, What's the third P? Um, I would say the, the three Ps of the sport, passion, patience. 
<laughs> the end. <laughs> the end. I was gonna say pot, but I don't smoke, so <laughs> uh, definitely yeah, what not. About, what about Pat Gooden? Oh, there you go. Passionate. Well, this is already passionate, Pat. True. Yep. All right. Uh, I'm good with the Instagram questions. Paco, do you have any more? I think that's that's good. I mean, everything else is pretty silly, and obviously Aaron already <laughs> answered. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah. Go look. Uh, Aaron answered a bunch of the questions himself before the show. I mean, to be fair, we're having technical internet difficulties. Why the? Uh, First portion of the show is not live, but you can catch the whole video version uh, later on on Facebook if you wish. Uh, Farouk, do you have any closing remarks? Aaron, do you have any closing remarks? Um, go, ahead, go ahead, man. Farouk. Yeah, no, you're good. I was just going to say, going back to my last message, or the last question, um, as my closing remark, I'll use that. Um, I don't think I said that eloquently enough or, like, enough. Um, drivers and, like, in my, in my clinics about media... Um, there is the ability to be a pro drifter, um, or at least like take that as your life's passion and get paid and do that full time. Um, marketing and everything at the grassroots level is sustainable if you're good enough at it. And it's amazing that you have that opportunity now, if you learn to go like utilize that, because before you either went to formula D and maintained like some type of drifting life, you became a fabricator, you became like some cameraman, you became somebody that worked at a company that, re, you know, like maybe you work at BC Racing and you do something there and, you know, like you get into the industry somehow and sustain yourself to get out of like some job that has nothing to do about racing. And you have an entirely new career path if you can learn enough about it and get good enough about it and own your own audience so no one else owns your audience. You deliver entertainment directly to them. If you can figure all of that stuff out, it's also scalable, which like if you were a fabricator, you can only build so many cages a day. Whereas being an entertainer can scale with, you know, near infinite results and stuff. So it's an incredibly cool time period now that YouTube has disintermediated, you know, like the ability to broadcast yourself from, you know, just some TV station. You live in like the golden age of self-distribution. Um, and even people think it's, you know, kind of passed them by in the last three years or four years since it started. It hasn't. Like we're still in the infancy it's yeah. absolutely amazing. Well, you Learn literally it, just do it. pinpointed my career path. So, I mean, I started with a shitty YouTube video series, and then now I literally get paid to make videos. So, all That's things interesting. And also, as a side note, as everyone on the show knows, uh, if they listen to every episode, at some point, my goal was to become a Formula Drift Pro 1 driver, and then I realized that I had no fucking chance. So, uh, <laughs> I, continued, I continued doing what I'm good at, which is, uh, at least marginally good at, which is making uh, branded content. So... <laughs> yeah, both sides of the coin right there. You can uh, do whatever you want, but also, uh, you know, maybe I would have been a pro one driver if I stuck with it and I'd be kicking James Dean's ass. Let's just assume that's what would have happened and go from there. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Done. All right. Go on. Better than James Dean at drifting. We all agree. You heard it here first from Aaron and Farouk. Uh, he wouldn't have had a chance. That's it. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> all right. No so, <laughs> I get. I guess. They're baffled. Uh, uh, my takeaway from the night is I think we're all on the same page as saying it in different ways. Uh, FD is a, a pretty amazing thing what they did as far as taking us away from D1 drifting and kind of giving us um, a standardized thing that we can all compete in. But that's not to say that's the only cool thing in drifting by any means. And dra grassroots drifting getting highlighted so heavily in the past few years is badass because those people are passionate in a different way. Um, you know, you look at the people that um, Lone Star Drift hosts or Sonoma Drift hosts. Um, these are guys that come out, you know, for us, 27 weeks a year. It's incredible that they drift that often and they're door-to-door -door that often. And it's it's not for some kind of, I don't know, not, not for some kind of media fame or anything like that. It's just because they want to get sideways and get on somebody's door. And I don't know if we take everything we've talked to, it's cool that everybody got highlighted and it's cool that we talked to the, about those people that sometimes don't get the spotlight. So yeah. Thanks to Aaron for uh, coming to the show. Thanks for having me guys and hope to see y'all soon. And we, okay, I'm going to do a shameless plug. You ready for this? Yes, yeah. Uh, we want them all. We've got a big old event in December, winter jam. So we talked about last uh, earlier on the show. Yeah. Winter jam. Uh, what is that? Where is it? How do people get involved? Uh, 16th, 17th of December. Uh, it's 150 bucks to drive on six tracks at a NASCAR track uh, over two days. 
Um, Which is a damn steal, considering that most dress events cost that much for one night at one track. So, But the steal is this. Uh, if you uh -huh. register by December 1st, um, you can register for... You get a suit, a SFI suit, um, SAE helmet, a neck brace, and registration for $356, and you get to keep all the stuff. So we, we pride ourselves in the safety and everything. Um, come out, have fun, bang some doors, and uh, get sideways. Nice. And what if I just want a neck brace and I don't want to drive? How much is just the neck brace? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find you one. Uh, the local right. store, I guess. Has, uh, has I, <laughs> I appreciate it. And yeah, uh, Freak, you've invited us out to uh, guest judge or guest host or just guest screw around at one of your events. And you guys unfortunately, or what? No, on? I don't think I'm not going to make this one, uh, unfortunately, just due to other, other job obligations. But I would very much like to take you up on that someday. Now that uh, we are, we are at least I am fairly close to uh, you there. Actually, Sonoma, I just drove back from my dad's in San Francisco for Thanksgiving. It, still, camping, took, man. it still took six hours to drive. Okay. It took six hours to drive from Phoenix to L.A. I thought that like San Francisco would be like, oh, I'll just drive across this mountain here. No, it's still <laughs> six hours. This is a damn big state. Um, but that, that doesn't matter. Anyways, thank you so much for coming on the show, uh, Aaron. And for, uh, good discussions are what drifting is all about. And hopefully this was at least a satisfactory discussion for all of you. But continue the discussion online at your favorite venue in the most responsible and uh, fact-seeking way. Just be, uh, be, be excellent to each other, as Bill and Ted had once uh, said correctly. Yep. So thank you, boys. Uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to the show on Patreon if you're down with it. Paco, uh, uh, post be show before, we got some merch. Yeah, before we go, yeah, uh, yeah well, let's let's just send these guys uh, to bed because they're probably yeah. tired of a bullshit. So, Talk about our um, at the end. Aaron, we're gonna... Aaron, thanks a lot. Uh, Farouk, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, and, uh, you're welcome anytime to come back to the show. And actually, yeah. Farouk, hopefully we'll talk to you again as a driver more than as, uh, as an event organizer. Yeah. Uh, now that we're on the off season, to get get some updates on your program and what's new for for the next year. And that's it for you guys. <laughs> well, bye. Yep. Thanks, cool. thanks a lot, boys. <laughs> Goodbye. Uh, bye, Aaron. Bye, bye, Farouk. All right, uh, bye. So, uh, before we actually close uh, uh, the show for the night, uh, some update. First of all, our buddy uh, Jared Van Aken. He sent us a super awesome thing. I want I want to show you guys on the on the oh, yeah. webcam. Yeah. So what this is is that while he was at Irwindale this year, he gathered uh, signs from a lot of drivers uh, on a uh, edible arrangement. Uh, signatures. Gathered signatures. Signatures. Not signs. Yeah. Sorry, my bad. Signatures. Your word. And. Uh, so this was a, an official proposal to get a Formula Drift round on Vegas. So after he got all the all the signatures, then he brought it to Jim Lau and Ryan Sage, and they signed it uh, in agreement. So this is the official document. We we hold the official document that is the actual cost for the Vegas Drift. Wait, hold on, back that up. So I didn't know that aspect of it. So this was, this was. With the the crowd sourced fundraising, whatever you want to call it, the, this is the edible arrangement uh, petition to get drifting in Vegas. Formula drift back to Vegas, yes. Yeah. And it's okay. it, they, you know uh, Ryan Sage and Jim Law, they couldn't they so couldn't it, deal with the pressure after the yeah, all signatures. So it worked. It worked. So uh, Jared <laughs> J Jared Van Aken's fault. Rick's still here, by the way. You can hear him laughing. <laughs> It's okay. uh, but yeah, that, we just want to give you the opportunity to leave. Feel free to stick around as late as you want. But um, but yeah, that's. I think if, if there's one important impact we've had on drifting as a whole, if the show were to end tomorrow, is that there's a bunch of bullshit inside jokes that are going to persist hopefully for a long time, such as the edible arrangements. Uh, get yeah. up. So so thank you so much for getting every, uh, not every, but a ton of drivers to sign this edible arrangements thing and send it to Paco. That's incredible, and yeah, uh, it'll definitely go up in our. Maximum Driftcast Studio. I would it's, say I, th I think it deserves a, a, a really prime spot in that studio there. Oh, Papa. yeah, absolutely. It's going to be probably next to Larry and Tyser. Great. Or, yep. And uh, the other thing is that uh, if you guys haven't been watching the video, I've been drinking off my spaghetti koozie uh, beer. Look at this. Ooh. We, we have. Wait, you're not drinking a beer. You don't drink beer. It's a uh, uh, cider. What? It's a. Ah. Uh, you got me. Got me, Sam. So yeah, we have the spaghetti koozies. Um, we're gonna have them available on our website pretty soon. Our pretty friend, soon. Our friends oh, uh, from Drift Raff, 
they did an amazing job in making this super cool photographic quality uh, scusis. Because here's the thing, if you guys like to drink when you're in school and you don't want to be spotted, you just slide one of these guys in your, in your drink. <laughs> and he means if you're in school over 21, because that's a legal drinking of course. age. Don't do yeah. what I did, which is fill a thirst buster full of beer. Exactly. Out of all the ways, I think I've brought this up on the show before, I forget. But <laughs> it, when I, my way of drinking in, in high school occasionally was I would uh, bring a thirst buster full of beer. <laughs> like, you, you know, you could put like a little bit of vodka and a Coke or something. Mm. That's gross. Why would you do that? But, but I thought it'd be better to just bring a thirst buster full of beer. That was well, really foolish. Now you know better, Sam. Now you can just get the spaghetti. Now juicy. I can just get a regular yeah. can of beer. Yeah. And put the spaghetti koozie on it, and your teacher's going to be like, hey, Peter, because your name's Peter in this situation. Yeah. Hey, Peter, what are you doing drinking that can of that, that cylindrical-shaped spaghetti right there? What are you doing, Peter? And you can be like, nothing, teach. Just <laughs> drinking my spaghetti. Spaghetti, my spaghetti protein shake. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so there's that. We also have these uh, super cool uh, keychains. You know, they're like the remove before flight tags, mm -hmm. but they say maximum drift cast. Which, no joke, that was the first mod I did on my S14 when of I got course. it, was I got a remove before flight keychain. I mean, you, you think I'm joking, I'm not. I'm that kind of a um, um, dork. <laughs> so, uh, good news, we have those. We have and, them. Uh, well, but, but they're not available for purchase yet, but uh, yet. All, all proceeds will, of course, go directly to Paco's English lessons. Uh, gracias. And uh, one of these days, he's going to learn to speak right. Si. Right, Paco? Y también tenemos <laughs> unas calcomen... I mean, sorry. Uh, so we also have the new stickers, uh, Maximum yep. Driftcast stickers. Also, bodies from Driftref came up with this. Very, it's, it's like a simplified version. Yeah. Uh, so oh yeah, we cool. uh, that that's going to be up on the site very shortly. We're no doubt. We'll no doubt tell you all about it the second it goes live. But uh, look for those things when they come out. And uh, yeah, all we'll things. Keep you guys updated. Support the show. And with that, it was, that? Uh, we just have to thank our sponsors. Mm -hmm. Thanks, AM Intakes, for supporting the show. You guys are awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, my cloud clutches as well, because they they've done a great job of supplying us parts for our drift cars. Are you are you still mi uh, missing anything for your car, Sam? Uh, yeah, quite a few things. There you go. No, well, just kidding. Uh, it needs, oh. just needs like a weekend of TLC, and then then I'll be able to drive at some, some point here. Some elbow grease. Needs a couple of grease from an elbow. Nice. There you go. Yep. And uh, finally, thanks to our patrons. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, we we wouldn't be here without you because we would have literally uh, stopped doing it because Paco was spending too much money. Jeez. So thank you guys, we appreciate it, and uh, we will hopefully see you all next week live uh, on the Facebooks when Paco's internet provider stops screwing him. <laughs> well, I mean it worked half the way in there, but there's still the tech is showing tomorrow anyways. Got to make sure. But yeah, that but you're gonna upload the full fine. the full video version yes. again after right now as soon as we as soon as we hang up. Yep. All right. So, well, uh, good talking to you without Corey, Paco. It's a really nice, really yeah. nice time having Corey here, <laughs> and hopefully he never comes back. Right? Uh, yeah, I totally agree. This was the greatest time ever. <laughs> no, I, I completely disagree. I miss Corey to death, and we hope Corey yep. is back with us next week once he gets over his uh, World of Warcraft raid. Yeah, that's it. And uh, thanks, Brian, for uh, operating the control thanks, rooms. Thanks, And uh, we'll see you guys next week.